Hello and welcome to the Amherst Conservation Commission. Uh, date is May 8th, 2024. The time is 7.06. We have all members present tonight and Amherst staff, Aaron Jock and Dave Zomek. Um, first up on our agenda is um, comments from me. I just want to give a plug to No Mo May. We're in May. Um, Anything you can do to set aside some of your lawn or cut it less frequently is good for the, the pollinators and beneficial insects. So uh, we all know about loss of uh, birds and such, but we're also in an insect apocalypse, which is the term the New York Times gave it. So um, Xerxes Society is a really good um, resource for that. Um, but yeah, anything you can do to just do less on the lawn in the month of May can go a long way. All right, that's all I have. So I'm going to hand it over to Dave. Good evening, everybody. Um, just have four or five quick updates. Um, let's see, starting off, it is budget season in the town. And I usually, you know, just mention this to the commission, just so you know that, you know, kind of where we are with staff and, and um, what is happening on, at the town manager level. So um, for May 1st, Paul Bachelman, our town manager, did uh, present his budget uh, for review by the community and the council. Um, it's available to you on the website. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, really, from the conservation department uh, standpoint, there, there aren't any major changes. There you know, clearly no new positions. There's not significant increases in, uh, in uh, operating um, We'll see about a 4% uh, increase across the board. The one um, change which really doesn't significantly affect us is that um, at the urging of, of uh, and with the support of a number of uh, department heads, uh, Paul Wackerman did decide to move sustainability um, from conservation uh, and, and create its own department. Um, this is uh, Stephanie Ciccarello is our is sustainability director. And she is now a department of one. And um, historically, sustainability, for as long as we've had um, a significant presence with sustainability, the last couple of years in particular, sustainability has been nestled or, or uh, nested within conservation. And given the importance of that role in the town and the town council's goals, um, Paul had decided to move that out, which is uh, makes all the sense in the world to me and others. So. You'll see that uh, referenced in the FY25 budget. Other than that, um, you know, there, we do have uh, significant funding uh, coming through CPA for trails. Uh, we have some capital money for trails in the budget. So take a look at the budget. If you have any questions in two weeks, um, feel free the, the council to ask me. The council will or email me. Or, or call the council will be uh, reviewing the budget um, in May and June for um, you know review and um, and approval uh, sometime during June. Um, what else is going on? The open space and recreation plan is moving. Um, we are under some pressure with with this update to get it done because we you know it makes us eligible for a number of grants. So we'd like to get it done by late June, early July in time to submit it to the uh, to the state. Unfortunately, we're losing one of our planners who was working with Aaron and myself and others. Uh, Rob Wachilla is uh, um, a planner who, who has gotten another job in another community and we congratulate him, but it's kind of a bum bummer for us because we're losing some uh, some people power and, and bandwidth uh, for that for that um, that effort. But it, um, Aaron has worked on a number of these, and so have I through the years. So we're going to kind of pick up the slack together and work with Nate Malloy and Stephanie Ciccarello and others to get that draft uh, um, finished. And you will see a draft of that in the coming four to five weeks, is my guess. We do have some upcoming meetings on that. Aaron, off the top of my head, I don't have the dates on that, but maybe you could send those to the commission when, when we have those locked in. Um, what else is going on? <clears throat> Just a quick update on the Fort River Farm, the community gardens there. I know a number of us have been down there. Um, Alex and others um, did identify a uh, drainage issue that we're having with one of the adjacent properties. Uh, there is an outflow pipe there from some 
uh, likely from some French drains, uh, uh, foundation drains that is emptying, uh, ultimately emptying down into our parking lot and uh, working with our building commissioner and Aaron and myself, uh, we've come up with a short-term solution to that, basically uh, some PVC pipe uh, to get it off the parking lot and, and get, get water moving in a, in a different direction. And then we do have a plan for regrading the parking lot. Um, the original parking lot there was uh, supposed to have swales along the edges of the parking lot. Um, and that through, went through the commission a couple of years ago now. Um, so um, we hope later this summer to do some regrading of the parking lot and install the, um, um, the swales that were never installed in the first place. So we think this will have a huge impact, positive impact on parking, uh, not having kind of a squishy parking lot, but also water will be redirected away from the gardens and not go, um, not compromise some of the uh, community gardens. So um, we'll be doing that later this summer. Uh, Hickory trails are moving along. Um, you probably pass by there from time to time on West Pomeroy Lane. Um, our contractor, Taylor Davis, is doing great work um, between and among the various storms we have. So sunshine is good these days for building trails and getting solar done. Um, uh, Aaron can share some photos, perhaps uh, via email uh, of those trails. Uh, you know, uh, between this meeting and the weekend, um, but they are taking shape. And uh, Aaron and I are out there multiple times a week, making sure where turtle barriers are secure, sediment uh, barriers are secure, and Pure Sky and our consultants, our uh, contractors, um, Taylor Davis, are doing um, what they're supposed to be doing. So the loop trail along West Pomeroy Lane is coming together, I think, they're probably, I'm going to say they're 45% done with that, 35 to 45% done with that. And we're having them focus on that first. So um, so if we get some good weather here, they can really move quickly if they get good dry weather. Let's see, we're waiting on a couple of grants. Um, Aaron and I mentioned we put in a dam and seawall grant for Puffer's Pond, the dike and the dam there. We're waiting on a word on that. I'm hoping to get that in June. Um, if we do get that, um, it will be for design, as we mentioned some weeks ago, for design and permitting for uh, dam improvements and more specifically dike improvements up at Puffer's Pond. And then we're also waiting on a, um, I believe it's a DCR or a DCS trails grant that we put in to supplement some of the money we have for trails at, at Hickory. So. Um, both of those are pretty big. I think one is uh, over $400,000 for puffers and the one for hickory, I think, is on the order of one hundred and twenty, hundred and twenty-five thousand, 125000 something like that with, with some matching in there. And then lastly, um, Puffer's Pond is picking up with the hot weather, with the warm weather. Brad and his, his team of one, um, Anthony, uh, have been busy up at Puffer's Pond. Uh, they had a good day there yesterday walking and talking to uh, residents and users up there. Um, and um, and we are in the process of interviewing for summer staff. So if you know anybody that wants to work on the trails, work at Buffers Pond, they can apply for that position through the town website. And we're, we're starting interviews next week. So we'll be hiring, my guess, budget, budget permitting two to three um, uh, full or part-time people to work on the trails this summer. So that's kind of a quick smattering of five or six things that we're working on in the department and between departments. Happy to take any quick questions if you have them. Thanks, Dave. Alex, I see your hand up. You wanna? Yeah. Cut. Dave, with regard to uh, Stephanie and sustainability, will her responsibility for one of the community gardens go with her or does that stay with you? Um, no, Stephanie will still, um, be the the head lia the chief liaison to the community gardens at Fort River. It's a project she started, and she has great personal and professional interest in uh, sticking with that. So yeah, she'll continue to be the uh, the liaison. And keep in mind, um, Stephanie will still report to me. I oversee conservation planning, inspection services, facilities, a couple of other departments. So she'll second question. She'll, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm all done. Second question with regard to the budget, is there a chance that um, 
Aaron will once again have uh, an intern or some sort of assistance uh, so that we can have our subcommittee meet more often. Um, Aaron, Aaron has historically had interns. Um, I'm not sure whether we've paid those interns. Aaron has been very resourceful in getting interns uh, through through the UMass and through the high school. Um, there's very little funding in our budget to pay interns. So we do what we can when we can to try to find money around the edges. But um, again, I think it it's probably more fruitful to seek internship uh, students uh, looking for internships or co-ops. Thank so you. I think the short answer is we don't have any money to pay interns. I don't think any department does in town. Okay, um, I see a hand up from the public, so I'll just take this now, but please, um, two minutes, probably for you, Dave, Ken, um, Aaron, I don't have the ability to put them in. Again, is this uh, relevant to Dave's director report? I, I hope so. I, I'm sorry to, to ask a question. If it's not relevant at this time, please just don't answer it. Um, I was wondering about, uh, I heard about trails in Puffers Pond area and uh, Pomeroy Lane. And I was wondering if there's anything planned for the Casey Trail and the pond that's flooding here on uh, in South Amherst. Um. So yes, Casey Trail, uh, Casey Trail will be receiving some attention. I just met with um, Brad Borderweek this morning, or, or excuse me, this morning, our, our land manager, and um, we are talking about some rehabilitation of some of the bog bridging there. I'm not sure which pond you're talking about. Which pond are you talking about in South Amherst? There's there's a number of them. Uh the one that's uh, just across Middle Street from the bog bridges that I think you're talking about uh, between Middle Street and Bay Road. Uh, you mean the beaver ponds there that are east of, of uh, Middle Yeah, Middle they're, they're, they're beaver ponds right now, but they're they're actually natural ponds. Um, uh, so, I, I guess the short answer is those bonds actually came up in my meeting this morning with, with Brad. Um, we are talking about those bonds. We are working on kind of a plan for those bonds. Um, there, I just, I don't want to go into great detail tonight, but happy to have this offline. They're an incredible asset there, but they're also um, a, a bit of a worry uh, for me and for the town, given the volume of water that is backed up behind those dams. Um, we have just gotten some consulting work done with Beaver Solutions, which is kind of the go-to uh, Beaver non-lethal, for the most part, non-lethal solutions to dealing with uh, managing beavers. Um, I can't make any promises right now, but we, we do need to look at that situation. Um, it's a bit concerning for me, more than a bit concerning. Um, yeah, it's, it's flooding the Casey Trail right now. It's a, almost a yeah. possible. But you know about so we that. need we, we need to do some better water management there. Um, there was a situation, I believe it was last year in 2002, where a beaver dam gave way in Belchertown and very significant infrastructure was was uh, impacted. I think it cost the, the town of Belchertown between 800000 and a million dollars to re redo a road that was washed out. So just got to be mindful of the infrastructure down downstream. So bottom line, we are looking at that, I think. I already have a quote from Beaver Solutions for some of their approaches. So, so I appreciate you bringing that in. Please, you know, if you have observations, you can always email me that or call me. Thank you. Thanks for keeping an eye out, Ken. Um, yeah, and in general, just for the public, Brad has come on before and sort of welcomed um, anybody's observations of trails because they do have a lot to keep track of. So if you see trees down or um, problems, emailing, I guess, Brad or Dave or the Conservation Department in general, just to let them know what's going on out there. Okay, um, I think we can move on to minutes. So we have 410 and 424. 
if there's no edits or comments, just looking for a motion to approve them. I move that we approve the minutes. I second. Alex on the motion, Laura on the second. Rachel? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. No, I'm an eye. Did I get everyone? I'm having to scroll. Um, okay. Um, let's see, Landy's applications. So this came in a little late, but um, it's timely. It's public health related. So I'm willing to move on it if, every, if everyone else is okay with it. So it's a, it's a tick study. Um, I think it's the University of Massachusetts in conjunction with um, other organizations and on several um, town properties. And I think it's a, th it's a three year study, Aaron, but do we, do we do this every year? Are we giving them license to do this? Not license, approval to do this for the three year period. I just saw that it was a three year study on their land use application. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've, we've sort of gone around about how to do this. And I think, um, the short answer is that we'd like to see like sort of an an, an annual approach to the um, land use applications um, just to make sure that um, we know kind of on an annual basis what's going on on the land. And sometimes when we issue like uh, a multi-year um, permit, there's some confusion about when the expiration dates are and then um, we lose communication with people. So um, okay. That sounds good. I did um, pull in. Um, oh, you were sorry. I just saw people appearing. I didn't know what was going on. Oh. Um, <laughs> I hope they rejoin. Okay. I don't know if they'll be able to. Um, yeah. So yeah. the um, the study, from my understanding, is at multiple conservation areas, um, and. They're looking to do tick collection for a research study. Um, one car parked at a trailhead with two participants, uh, very sort of low impact. Um, yeah, did, I mean, 40 by 40 plots, they're just gonna walk the perimeters um, and some markers. I didn't have any comments on this. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, I think we're, I'm good to approve this. If somebody would like to make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve Michelle. I second. Laura on the motion, Rachel on the second. Rachel? <laughs> Aye. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an I. Okay, are we at 7.30? You know, we have five minutes. Let's do, um, let's do emergency cert. Okay, um, so we got a request for emergency certification. Uh, a resident contacted me about a fa uh, failed foundation drain um, in High Point um, location where uh, during some of the heavy rain events that we've had recently, um, there backyard flooded into their house and they had to call the fire department and have it pumped out. Um, so they're basically excavating out the old failed French drain and and just replacing it. So um, very simple in terms of um, uh, straw wattle installation to protect uh, potential nearby yeah. wetland. It's a very, very small sort of low lying depression area. Um, and uh, pretty straightforward, but they were just filing in an overabundance of caution to make sure that um, they weren't doing anything wrong by putting in the French drain replacement. Thanks, Aaron. Andre, could you actually facilitate this one? I'm going to recuse. So um, basically all we need is a motion to ratify unless anybody has any concerns or questions. I can make a motion to ratify. Also want to note that um, I appreciate when community members come forth um, with these issues for the Conservation Commission. 
All right. Uh, Laura, on a motion? We have a second. Hi. I'm sorry. Uh, Rachel. Uh, Rachel with a second. Laura with a with a motion. Rachel with a second. Uh, Rachel. Aye. Laura. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Aye. Um, and Michelle's uh, recused from this. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And I'm an I. Okay. Thanks, Andre. You bet. Um, all right, what time is it? Three minutes. <laughs> all right. Um, I'll a couple of quick enforcement updates. Sure. To top two. So um, for 11 trillion, I'm happy to report that things are looking much, much better. Um, I went out, um, what day was it? Uh, Monday, I believe. And um, the the turf is fully installed. The um, I'm going to pull up pictures so you guys can see, but the um, backyard, um, the back slope is completely stabilized with biodegradable um, uh, it, um, erosion control blankets, and um, it's all seeded. There's some additional straw that's been placed, um, and they are working. They've contacted a, um, a surveyor to come out and place the 100-foot stakes. They're expecting that hopefully by our next meeting, the stakes will be placed so we can do a site visit to go out and actually determine where the 100-foot the buffer boundary is located. Um, but I mean, I'll just. Uh... Aaron, I have a quick question. You said that what the back or the front, I forget, is now has biodegradable um, fabric. Do both sides, because both were covered before and one of them had to be replaced? Or both That's a did. great point. Yeah. So the front still has the um, non biodegradable, the back is all biodegradable. Um, so, yeah, that's one one good point. Um, I will say like this, this, this is the front area on Trillium um, and they do have it covered in for the most part with mulch wood chips. Um, and this area, I would say with the exception of the fact that um, material was washing into the catch basins is otherwise outside of conservation commission jurisdiction. So I will defer to you on whether you want them to pull that out. I know that they had trouble locating the biodegradable mats initially, and so they got whatever they could to start stabilization to get it done as quickly as they could. Um, they were able to get the biodegradable mats for the back, but this one had already been installed, so they just left it in place. Okay. When I was out there, um, we did discuss with the landowner and the um, contractors that it was going to be replaced, so I'd like to see them make good on that. Okay. Wow, um, so, that looks very different and much yes. more stable. Great. Yeah, yeah. This is the the slope. So I'm extremely, extremely happy with the results. Um, that it's stable and seeded, and um, I just think a huge amount of progress was made since the last site visit. So, yeah, happy to report good on that one, um, and okay. we'll keep you updated for the next meeting. Um based on when the markers are put in place so that we can inspect and sort of get a sense of where the 100 foot boundary is located on that site. Great, and maybe also just a reminder about the front um, landscape fabric. Yes, yep. Thank you. Okay, any questions, commissioners? All right, um, second enforcement. Yeah, so the, um, the Wildflower Drive, um, they're, it's been a very challenging one communication with the landowner. Um, the landowner thought that they had retained someone um, and the person that they retained didn't want to take the job and declined the job. Um, and then the landowner was insisting that they were still doing the work. So I contacted the consultant that they thought had taken the job and they said, no, we declined the job already. Um, so there was a little bit of a um, circular communication going on there. Um, also, uh, so I did circle back with the landowner and say, sir, you know, this person is not taking the job, so you're going to need to find someone else and let me know when you're going to be filing a permit. In the interim, I did speak with town council. They drafted a letter to send in hopes of kind of um, 
urging this along a little faster. So there is a draft letter. I wanted to get your approval before I send that um, or before the town attorney sends that to the, the landowner. Um, but yeah, we're still, you know, working to, there is a, um, there seems to be a lot of difficulty sort of communicating, um, understanding what needs to be done. There's a, a strong, um, uh, I'll say linguistic barrier. So we're, we're working with the landowner to try to help them understand what the kind of expectations are and, um, uh, the deadlines and so forth. So continue to make those efforts. It's just been difficult to do with lots of other yeah. items um, going on. Well, we have a letter in hand and I feel like that's a very clear communication. So maybe just show of hands who's ready to have that letter sent. I, how many, like it's been over a month that we've been in communication with this. Um, so yeah, we have letter and we're just looking for commissioner input on whether or not you want to send that now or hold off to some date certain um okay hands up send letter now okay i'm seeing a majority there so i think we're ready to have the you forward it or the um town council send that letter okay okay i have a question go ahead alex explain town council Oh, well, I, I think that's that be... what I call the lawyer, the town lawyer, what? Town attorney. Town attorney, I call okay. it. Okay, not, okay. Uh, maybe the S is what I mean, <laughs> sorry. Not, um, not town counselors. Right. Special counsel and then a lawyer, sorry. Well, um, that's my job. We have several town counselors. I didn't, I thought somehow the letter was coming from them. Oh, okay. Well, does it change your position no, on? Okay. No, just All right. Okay. I will try and use preferred language. Okay. I think we're ready to move on to our hearings. Okay. Hearings. Um, general procedures. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. It's five minutes from staff, five minutes from the applicant, five minutes of public comment or two minutes per person and five minutes from commissioners. All materials are required to be submitted by Wednesday, the week prior to the meeting at close of business. For all presenters, please clearly state your name, address of the project to are representing, as well as preferred pronouns. Same for members of the public. Um, and let's see, first up we have, I'm gonna open this one. Um, this is a public meeting, Erin. Correct. This public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Bylaws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protections of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of the Amherst General Bylaws. So this is a request for determination, Keith Morris on behalf of New England Railroad, Central Railroad Company for verification of sensitive area locations along the New England Central Railroad right of way uh, railroad right away extending from Leverett to Belchertown. So I just want to thank Rachel and Bruce for going out there and doing an hour and a half of review on the railroad. <laughs> I hope that was interesting at least, <laughs> but I we really appreciate um, you doing that. That hugely helpful. We've been talking about this for a long time. So um, do one of you want to, well, Aaron, do you want to hand it over to them? Or I know that they were sort of, um, summarizing um yes i just okay. I, I sorry i didn't mean to um i just noticed that the uh person who got accidentally kicked off the the zoom call for the um earlier land use application is back on so i'm I was just sending her an email letting her know her land use application was approved okay. and i didn't Thank want you. her to sit on the meeting all night right. waiting for that um so uh yes and bruce was out on the on the um site visit as was rachel and i'm going to yield to my comments to bruce so that he can sort of state any um comments on the final plan set um it sounds like we're we're close to um being ready to approve that so i'll just yield to bruce okay so in the folder, there was a map that I've created 
Rachel took pictures. I took one or two, but sometimes I don't know if Rachel's pictures are in the folder or not. But um, so we rode with Keith Morris, as you can see from the memo. Um, you can, if you have any questions about the bullet points I wrote, I, we can try to answer them. But that was our understanding of what we saw. Um, there are pictures of uh, Mr. Morris re uh, repainting or ad adding a distance to the no spray parts. That's where he did a couple of times. Um, I tried to show on the map that there are culverts underneath the railroad track that the railroad is responsible for. It might be that down the road, we would want to take a look at those and see what condition they're in. That's a question. Um, then let's see. I think the one major thing I think that is not in his um, memo to us um, is in part A, way up there in the north part, it looks like it's above what says Lilac Lane, but that's not precisely where it is. But it, the picture that I sent shows a very steep bank, and at the bottom of the bank, there is a stream. And it's in a spray zone, as far as I remember that I recorded at the time. Um, the issue is that, yes, it's 20 or 30 feet down the bank. But on a, as a horizontal coming off the track, it's probably, I don't know, it's, it, there's no way to know how far it is. It's probably more than 10 feet horizontally from the track. But it's right there. And so I think we could ask the railroad uh, Mr. Morris to add that particular section, I don't know how long, but long enough to protect the stream that is maybe technically outside their 10-foot zone, but right there where, where it will receive spray if the wind is blowing and such things. Um, I guess the other two things have to do with the third bullet, which has to do with notifying of butters. And I understand that there's, there's a lot of abutters. And so they do put notices in the paper and stuff. But there were two gardens that we observed right next to the track, uh, one in the north and one in the south. And I do think that we could ask the railroad to at least identify those people and make sure they get notified personally when this spraying is going to happen, because they're both in spray zones. And then the last thing would be if they can't do that or it's just that isn't going to happen. He did say, and if you look at the pictures that are in the folder, there are many pictures of standing water right next to the track in the spray zones. And he said that when they go out to do the spraying, if it's just scheduled at a certain time and there's been rain and there's standing water, then they, then they don't do it when they see the standing water. Okay, well, then he could also add the two gardens to that same protocol. So those were the ideas I had. I can talk with Aaron about the part B, which is offline, which is a project that I assume we're part of where the, the silk fence is completely down, but it's way far away, but you can see it from the train from our little truck oh, i know which site you're talking about okay so yeah it's, that's it's my hard. report i'll uh, i yield to rachel if i've left anything out thank you Bruce. rachel do you want to thank you Bruce, and thank you for um being controlling the map while we were going down the railroad it was really cool to see um a north south transect of amherst conservation lands to see them all tied together sequentially it was really cool um but we were moving quickly and so i was taking photos and bruce was keeping us located on the map so we, we could correlate our comments. So thank you, Bruce. Um, other, uh, the other thing, other things that um, came out of the conversation with Keith is that their vegetation management is not just for movement of the train, but also visibility. They said they have a lot of people wandering, people wandering into the tracks and just standing. And sure enough, while we were going down, down the tracks, someone was just standing there completely oblivious that we were coming. coming Headphones there. on. Yeah, completely oblivious, up in tall vegetation. They said that they also do cutting, so what they can't spray, they'll cut. Um, and there are a number of invasives there. We saw the usual suspects, autumn olive, bittersweet, uh, a couple Jap Japanese knotweed. 
Um, and and I, yeah, I agree. I agree with Bruce. It was really concerning to see vegetable gardens right up against the the railroad and think about you know impacts to those butters um, with with the spraying. Um, and then there were areas that they hadn't you know that we identified to add, which keep added to the plans um, that looked like they were, were starting to become hydric soils with um, skunk cabbage and other aquatic vegetation emerging. And he he quickly got out and sprayed right on the spot on the tracks, marking it as a no a no spray zone um, to help facilitate the preview. Thanks, Rachel. Um, okay, Keith, do you want to have five minutes to present or respond or? Sure. Yeah. I mean, my name is Keith Morris, consultant for New England Central Railroad. Yeah, I have no, uh, Bruce, I have no problem marking that area. I just kind of wish we made that decision out in the field, but I have no problem going back out there and doing that. Thank you. I know it's like Rachel had some questions and was making notes. That's why I said, if you know, if you want to change it, let's decide it now. So hopefully we can get it wrapped up tonight. So that's no problem. Uh, just maybe contact Aaron specifically where you where you were talking about, and I can get out there and, and remark it. But as far as the actual spraying, which isn't part of the application, but you had talked about gardens and lawns and other things. Uh, I actually ride, it's a, it's a big tanker truck. It's like 35 feet long. It rides right on the uh, high rails and it has a spray boom. It's like 12 to 18 inches off the ground with probably 20 nozzles, which they can actually control each nozzle. But I actually ride with the licensed applicator. And for this railroad, it's probably been doing it for like over 25 years. And I have the plan. So it's very conservative when you come up to like someone's garden and we have places where they have blueberry bushes. Believe it or not, out east, there's actually daycares. The fence is right up along the track. So that's pretty conservative. I mean, this year, if you give me the addresses of those two people, I have no problem doing that, but rather not make a habit of it because there's a lot of areas in different towns where, you know, things are going on right next to the track. Same thing with like cornfields and that kind of thing. They're uh, they're very conservative as far as spraying. But I did make two changes, as as Rachel said. Uh, one is just south of Strong Road, on the east side of the tracks. We extended the no spray quite quite a bit. I don't know the exact distance, but I did mark it out in the field, as as Rachel said. And then I think it's Southeast Street. We extended it uh, quite a bit to the north north uh, north northwest, I believe up up the other side of Southeast Street. And I did make the changes on the maps and I think I emailed them, Aaron, Monday morning. But I do appreciate you guys coming out. Some commissioners do, some don't. It's easier said than done planning with the railroad, but they were uh, very accommodating. So so those, that's what we're looking to get approved for tonight. Great. Thanks, Keith. Uh, commissioner comments. Um, if there's any public comments, please raise your hand. I'll just keep an eye on the on the room. Commissioners, any comments? Alex? Keith, can you remind me what herbicide you spray? Uh, it's part of the yearly operational plan. What we do, we have to notify. There's a 45-day review period. Each three, three departments in each town that we go through gets a, uh, a certified letter with a link to a website that has the YOP, the monitor notice and all the details. But just to read them off here, uh, it's Aquanet, OpenSight, Polaris and MSO Extra, which I think is like a drift agent, but that's what they're spraying this year. Sometimes when I send in that letter, they'll post it on their website. So if there's any neighbors or whatever, they can go to the link and actually see the whole, it's like between the MSDS sheets and fact sheets and everything. It's like some of them over 200 pages, but it, has details on the spray programs and exactly the mixtures and so forth. Thank you. Okay, so just to confirm, Bruce had some comments about additional areas and Rachel had some comments about additional areas and they've been or will be marked in the field and updated on the no spray maps. Is that correct? Is, is there anything that's still in question about um, revisions to the no spray areas? So Michelle, are you asking Keith or? Oh, um, I can I can start with you. I don't know who, she, yeah. Yeah, so I talked with Bruce earlier and I think that we can move to approve this. Um, I just added 
So this is that we would issue confirming the resource area delineation within uh, 10 feet measured horizontally from the New England Central Railroad rail line based on the 5-3 ride along and the 5-6 map revision that the commission understands um, that if additional standing water is observed within 10 feet of the rail line, that those areas will not be sprayed and that the stream location with the steep slope between Bridge Street and State Street will not be sprayed. Where vegetable gardens are close to the tracks, abutters will be notified or areas will not be sprayed. So I okay. think that that so might cover the changes. In addition to just not being sprayed, can, can it be like, and we're talking about a 50 year permit here, right? So is there a map that that's gonna be delineated onto? I'm sorry, how what? many years, Michelle? Is I thought this was a very long term. But the, it's for the life of the BM, BMP, which is five years. Five, it's okay. Maybe I read that RDA, wrong. Which is three years. Okay. Well, irregardless, um, just because the map will probably get reused or referred to year after year, I'm just I'm asking if there's some map that it's going to be. Um, I, will, I will make that change, such as I did with the other two areas that Rachel and Bruce wanted changes out in the field. I made those changes on the maps and submitted a Monday. I will change this area and get that to uh, Aaron tomorrow or the, the next day. Great. Thanks so much, Keith. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have no further questions. Um, I just wish more people knew who had backyards facing a railroad that, you know, there was spring so they could relocate gardens, but I'm not, not in our purview. Um, then commissioner is looking for a motion. I move to issue a determination of applicability checking box 2A confirming that the resource delineation is accurate only within 10 feet uh, measured horizontally from the New England Central Railroad rail line based on the 5324 ride along and 5624 map revision. The commission understands oh. that it's the commission understands that if additional standing water is observed within 10 feet of the rail line not noted on the updated plan, those areas will not be sprayed. Stream location with street, steep location between Bridge Street and State Street will not be sprayed. And where vegetable gardens are close to the tracks, abutters will be notified or areas will not be sprayed. I second it. Andrea on the motion, Bruce on the second. Alex, do you have a question before we? Question. Can we add language that was just agreed to that the map will be updated? Do you want to? I think you have to amend the motion. Andrea, would you be willing right. to amend the motion? I'll amend motion? the motion to add the fact that the map uh, revision from 5624 will be revised again and submitted to, um, to the uh, uh, commission. And I need another second on that. Second. Okay, thank you. Andre on the motion, Bruce on the second. Alex. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Laura. Aye. Nam and I. Okay, thanks for making the time to allow us to do that, Keith. No problem. Uh, just one recommendation. I told a lot of commissions for comments on the uh, on the determination. I always recommend that they put the the delineations approved for the uh, purpose of weed spray only, because it's not an actual flagged delineation out in the field. It's just for the the weed spray program. But some commissions do, some don't. Okay. Okay. Thank Noted. you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate your help. All right. Good night. You. Good night. Okay. Okay, hearing number two. Yeah, and I'll let you bring anyone in that's here. I guess I'll Beth. Um, okay, this public hearing is called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31 wetlands protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is Amherst Department of Public Works for the replacement of an existing culvert at Potwine Lane, map 23A, lot nine on the Muddy Brook. Work associated with this project is proposed in bank land under waterway, bordering vegetated wetland, bordering land subject to flooding and riverfront. So 
Okay. Um, right. We, hi, Beth. Um, hi, Laura. Hi. Okay. Uh, Aaron, do you want to take five on this? Sure. So we had um, a site visit in the fields on Tuesday uh, that was attended by Rachel and Alex. There was a, a number of technical questions. So I want to make sure that um, I allow plenty of time for for Beth um, and uh, Laura to respond to those. Um, just sort of as a uh, point of information, I have not drafted orders of conditions for this. So if the commission, you know, feels like we're ready to proceed on this this evening, um, I would just ask that we, you know, consider closing the public hearing only and that I would have to prepare an order of conditions for the next meeting if, if that's the direction the board wants to go. Thanks, Aaron. Um, okay, Beth or Laura. Yep. Hi, I'm uh, Beth Wilson. I'm the environmental scientist with the Department of Public Works, and I'm here with Laura Sup, our consultant from Fuss and O'Neill. Um, yeah, I, I know you said five minutes, but I do have a little presentation that just has information about the culverts. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? Sure. But if we can just keep it to five, that would still be good too. I'll fly through it. Okay. Um, are you looking for? Let's see. Do you have any trouble sharing, Beth? Okay, there we go. All right. So, oops. There we go. Okay. I will be very quick. Um, culvert replacements in Amherst. Um, we've got a number of failing culverts in Amherst. It's hard to get them funded. They're not at DPW, the water and sewer enterprise funds and chapter 90 money typically don't go to the drainage system. Um, so in FY24, DPW applied for a municipal vulnerability preparedness action grant for three culvert locations. We got the grant, we collected um, data, and did um, a design and permitting as was the what was under that uh, grant application. And one of the locations was Potwine Lane over Muddy Brook, which is what this hearing is about. I'll be second hearing is one of the second locations, but this hearing is for that location. Um, Muddy Brook is a little bit west of the recreation fields on Potwine Lane, if people are trying to figure out where it is. Um, so we're completed. So far at the site has been wetland delineation survey, geotech study, hydrologic hydraulic study, um, and a permitting level design. And DPW has applied for FY25 MVP action um, grant funding for the construction costs for this potwine lane over Muddy Brook. Um, the goals of replacing these culverts are to improve flood resiliency, the designs are um, made to meet mass DOTs, hydraulic and um, scour design requirements and meet resilient mass action team um, hydraulic design to the year 2070 10 year storm. And the design is also one of the goals of the design is to meet the Massachusetts stream crossing standards, which um, require the span to be a 1.2 bank fill width and have an openness, openness ratio of 0.82. Potwine Lane. Um, currently, there are two corrugated metal culverts, um, elliptical culverts. The pipes are cracking and leaking, which is resulting in sinkholes between the road and the headwalls. You can see in this photo, like the headwalls are over here, um, and where this this drum is sitting is in a sinkhole. Um, the headwalls are collapsing, especially the upstream one. Um, the current culverts constrict. Um, the flow and are undersized for current and future storm events. They don't allow for aquatic and terrestrial wildlife passage. Um, resource areas that were identified during the wetland delineation or bank land under um, water bodies and waterways, bordering vegetated wetlands, bordering land subject to flooding, and riverfront. Potwine Lane is not located in a natural heritage mapped area. Um, no vernal pools are mapped in that area, and it's not an uh, uh, Muddy Brook is not an outstanding uh, resource water. Is that what it? Yeah. Um, so the design, like I said, is basically based on um, 
the data that we collected, the geotech study and the hydraulic and hydrologic and hydraulic study that we did. Um, it's a closed bottom. The design that we've put forward um, is a closed bottom concrete box culvert, nine and a half feet wide by six feet high. It'll be embedded two feet um, and in accordance with the Massachusetts stream crossing standards. Um, the created stream bed material is going to be natural rounded stone and or river rock. Um, with a gradation similar to the existing sediment in the area. Um, bankful width within the box culvert will be 6.7 feet. There'll be these little terrestrial passage benches that'll be 1.4 feet on both sides. Um, and it'll have an openness ratio of 1.05. Um, to, to determine the bankful width, um, measurements were taken 200 feet, both upstream and downstream part of the hydrologic and hydraulic study, which determined that the span needed to be at least 8.04 feet. We've got 9.5. Um, and the box culvert is going to sit on a 12-inch crushed stone um, pad. And, and that was one of the questions that came up during the site visit. Um, some folks were suggesting that maybe it should be sitting on a concrete pad. Um, but the geotech, we checked the geotech report recommendation was for a 12 inch cross stone pad um and i guess we didn't maybe at the site visit make it clear that it is a a, a box culvert it's not open bottom box culvert it's a four-sided box culvert concrete um so that's what the geotech people recommended um and then here is a cross section of it um, here, right here is the 12 inch stone pad and the actual culvert is uh, from here down to here. So it's six feet and here's the two inch embeddedness. Um, and I don't know if you can see over on the side over here, it does actually talk about the material and it's basically what I had said, natural rock wash river stone with a gradation and that's that. We're cruising on through. Here's a little bit more of the design. Um, this here, so here is the box culvert right here. The two head walls here and here. There's gonna be wing walls, four wing walls coming off, which there aren't right now. Um, there's gonna be some um, scour protection, which is what this, kind of looks like rock hatching there and, and on both ends. And that's according to MassDOT requirements. A um, little bit of grading on this side. The, the, the water flows from the bottom of the photo up to the top. Water flows in that direction. Um, what else can I say? The limit of work is this LOD around here and the actual excavation, tearing up of the road and everything is the shaded box. We are proposing some stormwater improvements. Um, in this diagram, you can see two catch basin locations. Currently, there's one catch basin that sits right on top of one of the current culvert pipes and drains directly right into the culvert pipe with no treatment. Um, stormwater that comes from the west in this drainage pipe right here currently goes into that catch basin. Um, and like I said, it's getting right into the river without any treatment. So what we're proposing are two new catch basins, which will sit outside of the box culvert. And they're gonna be um, deep sump catch basins with four foot sumps to treat some of the sediment in the stormwater. And they'll, they will be discharging from the wing walls which also gives them a few feet of being away from the actual stream channel. So, you know, once that gets sort of revegetated there next to the stream channel, there'll be a little bit of infiltration, a little bit of treatment of that stormwater. I, mean, I guess the only other thing I want to say about that is that this easterly, eastern one, we're not sure it's, if it's needed or not. There's a drainage pipe that currently you can see going into the current catch basin, but it's dry and there's an old sewer line design drawing that shows that that um, drainage line may have been removed. 
So we're not going to know if we need that eastern one until we actually excavate down and see what's going on with that drainage line. Um, if it doesn't exist or if it's been cut or whatever, then we won't be putting in that second catch basin. All right. Thanks, Beth. I want to just make sure we have enough time for um, commissioner questions and you can answer okay. how, how are we doing on yeah, um, I guess the only here. other thing I'd, is the dewatering. You guys are probably interested in that and resource area protection. Um, we can just go right to the diagram. We will have erosion control. That's what this is here and there and there. Um, we're going to have a um, construction entrance pads for sediment for collecting sediment from the trucks, and we'll have these two staging areas where the um, uh, stockpiled soil would go and equipment and stuff. Um, and then for dewatering, we've got coffer dams that are going to go in on both ends. And we have 24 inch bypass piping that we're going to use to get to have the stream be able to continue to flow through. Um, and then we have a construction, a dewatering um, settling basin because I, you know, I think there's going to be some water basically getting in there, even with the coffer dams. So we'll have a pumping, some kind of a pump system most likely then be using this basin. Um, and I could give you the details on that basin if you're interested in it. And so that's about it. I'm, that's good. <laughs> that was quick. Thanks. I'm good. Thanks. Beth. <laughs> okay. Um, if there's any public comment, please uh, raise your hand and I'll keep an eye on the room. I'm going to go to commissioner questions. And you know, thanks for the site visits. Those were out there. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, Beth, thank you for the clarification that it's a four-sided box culvert. When we were in the field, there wasn't, you know, any time to look at your drawings before that. Um and just for commissioner's sake, um, we th I thought it was a uh three-sided box culvert, which is why the concrete bed came up, but She's explained that that's not necessary because it's four-sided. The other comment was whether or not um, there's there the runoff from the street and the stormwater can be such that sand from the road, winter salting, sanding, does not go into the stream. And maybe Beth could comment on that. Um, yeah, so this is the pot wine location. So... I know we had talked about that at Middle Street and, and it, you know, same situation here, except in this situation we've got, we're going to have these catch basins right here that do have the deep sump treatment. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, sheet flow is, is going to come from the center of the road. Um, and then it, it would be sheet flowing in that direction. This is going to be a little higher elevation behind the catch basins. So water would be heading right into either one or both of the catch basins if we end up with two of them. Exactly. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay, Jason. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> is there going to be, I wanna make sure that I don't see in any details and I might've just missed it, that there's some sort of velocity dissipation or scour pad on the end of that 24 inch bypass pipe so that as the water's coming out, we're not having additional scour in the in the stream bed there. I don't so you're see talking about during during construction, right? So during when we yeah. when we've got the 24 inch um, bypass pipe. Correct. Yeah. Um, we can certainly um, discuss that with the contractor, um, and I want to make sure that they're comfortable. Uh, with how they do that with the bypass pipe. Um, and that could be something that we add, um, but thinking about that, that's scour protection that would need to be removed afterwards and it would be a, it would be a temporary impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, of, that's a good comment though. I've heard of um, like certain types of like plastic sheeting to be used at the outlet points of the pipe rather than putting in um, uh, stone, like a almost like a um, material that could be laid in the stream bed, so that so, the stream bed itself doesn't get washed out. Yeah, that's called a turbidity carpet curtain. Um, but typically, those are on deeper, deeper streams. Um, I don't think a turbidity curtain. Would, I don't think that's the appropriate thing to use in this situation. Right. You're gonna be. I mean, you're gonna either be putting rock down, potentially a, 
uh, like a this queen sheeting might work, but honestly, that it, I wouldn't recommend that either because if you have a discharge pump coming out on this queen, that's just going to speed the water up and increase its erosive potential. You need to have velocity dissipation. You need to have rock in there or, um, you know, some sort of portable temporary concrete, not a weird structure, but something to catch the water, slow it down, slowly release it like a uh, level spreader or something like that. All right. Yeah, I mean, in regards to additional temporary impacts, the, that portable concrete structure you just mentioned, Jason, might be more easy to remove. This isn't my wheelhouse, but um, just to not have things piling up in terms of impacts to the river. But um, yeah, let's let's add that to our list of questions and um, additional information. Um, Andre. Oh, sorry, I had one other question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. What What is the anticipated time frame for this project 2025 yeah we're, uh, we're... No, in the length of time for the project from start to finish oh i think laura weren't we saying like three weeks uh, no um eight weeks so we're anticipating <laughs> that this happens at the same time um as the next culvert that we'll be discussing the next public hearing um and hoping that the contractor can be this one and the same, and that they're thinking about these projects and, and purchasing products together to save a little bit of cost um, mm -hmm. and working one after another, but not at the same time because there'll be road closure. Yeah, okay. I'm just asking regardless of, or regarding the time of year as well, um, because I saw that the it's designed for a two year, 24 hour storm, which is like three inches, but we can get some big storms and, uh, you know, depending on the time of year. So just curious mm -hmm. about that. Well, right. we are planning to do it during low flow or, you know, that's, that's required. So we are thinking July, August, um, of 2025. Okay. And then, sorry, back to my, uh, first point about the scout protection on the discharge end of the pipe. It appears that the discharge pipe is on the downstream side of the coffer dam. Is that correct? And then will that pipe be elevated or is the coffer dam being built around the pipe? The coffer dam will be built around the pipe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We also okay. thinking about velocity dissipation, we could reuse the stones that will be scour protection like permanent ones, we could reuse those for velocity dissipation. Great. Um, Andre. Yeah, a uh, simple question uh, just for uh, comparison purposes. Uh, I think you the opening of the uh, new, um, of the new culvert is gonna be 8.6 or something like that. What is the opening of the current two uh, culverts that are there? So four. they're, oh, sorry. I okay. okay, they're currently uh, 58 inch by 33 inch um, is what their original sizes were. Our surveyor had a hard time because uh, they are depressed and crushed. Thank you. And uh, so that's, all right, 58 inches, so uh, each. Yes. Right? Okay. And the uh and what it's going to be replaced with is a single one, is that correct? That's what it's right. Yes, yeah. a nine nine point five by four opening. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Um I see an attendee with their hand up. I'm gonna allow them to talk. Go ahead. Um <clears throat> good evening. Um, am I, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so um, I had two questions. Um, one was a fairly simple one about um, for each of the culverts, um, what was the approximate time for road closure? I mean, a lot of the, uh, the work can be done without closing the road, but the question is, 
the, when the the road actually has to be closed, how much, how many weeks, days? How much? I we're hoping. Think, yeah, oh, we're go going to try and limit limit it to. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to go more than like four days or so for, and it, and it may be spread apart. We may, you know, close for a day to do something and then open it again, but it'll be a real effort to, to keep the roads open when they can be. Okay. okay. Um, for the um, caller, so could the you other... just, we just need you to state your name and address for the minutes. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, Vincent O'Connor, 175 Summer Street, Amherst. Great. Thanks. And, uh, and then the question, then the other question I have is in terms of um, the, the actual, the, the actual rainfall, um, um, what, hopefully you're not using the 1970s <laughs> data, which obviously not going to apply. But what, how do you correct, um, given that I, I don't think that the there's been like some kind of uh, new data thing issued for this area? I'm how having a correct? very difficult time hearing the speaker. Um, I okay. don't mean to interrupt, but I don't know if there's any way you could speak a little louder. Cause just take Okay, I can notes. do that. Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay. So the other question is about the um, the, the, the the rainfall or, forecasting. Yeah, yeah, the, I, yeah, I the gotcha. rainfall forecast because obviously the the nineteen seventies official data is way is not certainly anything you would want to use if you're you know trying to uh, yeah. Yeah. anticipate the future. Um, I can much less even deal with the present. Right. Go ahead, Laura. I think you can. Yes, I can speak to that. Um, so this is funded through an MVP grant, which is through the Massachusetts uh, Commonwealth. And we are required actually to be using resilient Massachusetts action tools. So that is um, climate, climate predictive tools developed by Cornell University. Um, and so it inflates the rainfall volumes uh, from today and it inflates them for, for predictive for the future. And so we're using 2070 um, events. And while it was designed for the 2070 10 year event, um, we have done predictive modeling that shows the road will be um, will be dry in the 2070 100 year event. Okay, and how much and how much rainfall is what is the predicted rainfall amount? As opposed, you know, the, the the present, the past, the present, and and the twenty seventy rainfall um, amount. Sure. Do, so do for the actual numbers. Yes. So for the hundred year storm, um, the present day is seven point eight three inches, um, and the future rainfall depth would be eleven inches. Okay. Thanks for having those numbers handy. Yeah. Laura. I know. I was like, <laughs> Woo! glad that's in the report. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Vincent. Um, hopefully you got You're what welcome. you Thank you. were looking for. Have a good one. Um, okay. So I don't see any more hands up. So it, I think the only additional item we had was Jason's question regarding the velocity dissipation and sort of the plan for that. Um, okay. So that's one thing. Alex, go ahead. No, I made a request to make sure that uh, sand doesn't come off the road into the stream. And what Beth gave me was kind of a maybe answer. If if we have uh, two um, catch basins, but I would I would the, the existing drain is right over the stream, which puts all the sand from the road into the stream, and would like to see the design positively made to stop sand from the road going into the stream. So okay. that that was a request. Okay. Also, for commissioner information, when we were there, I showed Beth a four by four that was entangled in the branches that was probably, I didn't measure it, but it was probably six or seven feet above the water. So there has been very high water there. Um, and that's probably because the culverts are, there's a, a wire, a beaver deceiver type wire in front of the culverts, which were kind of plugged up with vegetation. And maybe the culverts weren't fully functioning, but 
um, a lot of water goes through in a big storm. Thanks, Alex. Rachel? Thanks. Yeah, I had a question about um, the catch Jasons as a sediment removal, the deep sump, and I wondered if you guys might consider a hydrodynamic separator, such as like a storm scepter system that may be a little bit um, better at separating out some of those sediments or materials. Um, and then if not, also if any sort of um, any sort of uh, drip um, stone um, border on the edge of the road might be another way to capture any of that sediment that may not be going into the catch basement, but might be running off the side of the road that could be cleaned out periodically um, to help with that, prevent that material getting into the river. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I'm hearing that we have some maybe more significant comments that can be addressed tonight. So um, in regards, since we don't have an order of conditions drafted anyway, I'm going to suggest that we continue the public hearing and um, this discussion and hopefully um, DPW and Austin O'Neill can come back um, to address some of these comments. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, commissioners, unless you have any final suggestions um, that they can use prior to our next meeting? I'm looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for pot wine lane culvert replacement DEP number 089-0736 to 522-24 at 730. So moved. Second. All right, Alex in the motion, Laura on the second. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. Am I missing somebody? Rachel? Aye. Did I get you, Alex? No, aye. <laughs> okay, now an aye. <laughs> okay, sorry, it's just such a long list tonight. Okay, oh, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> All right, we'll see you um thank you. May 22nd. Well, they're staying thank you, Beth. with us thank for you, the Laura. Oh, right, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, welcome back to our next uh, public hearing. <laughs> Which is called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General ah. Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. And this is a notice of intent for Amherst Department of Public Works for the replacement of an existing culvert at Middle Street Map 26B, Lot 6, on a tributary of the Plum Brook. Work associated with this project is proposed in bank land under waterway bordering vegetation and riverfront. Okay, so hopefully we can sort of abbreviate this one with our design background. Okay. Yep, I don't have uh, to, I, I have a whole one for this, but we don't have to even okay. really look at it. Yeah, one question, did you get thing anything from Natural Heritage? I didn't see anything. Erin, do you wanna, no? Okay, she's shaking her head, no. I have not gotten anything yet. Oh, okay, that's so that's weird. pending. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we submitted it the day that we submitted to you guys. So that was, you know, two weeks ago. Okay. But well, we can check that, right? Yeah. Sometimes if we nudge them, they'll respond faster. Okay. Um. Yep. So this one is uh, very similar in, in all of where it got its funding from. It's just a different location. Middle Street, um, over a tributary to the Plum Brook, so sort of the southern end of Middle Street, right near Plum Springs Conservation Area. If you guys are familiar with that, that's where this location is. Um, oh, I forgot to change my pictures. <laughs> um, but Middle Street, um, similar to to Potwine Lane, um, has a collapsing downstream headwall, um, and and definitely is constricts the flow considering it's a it just has one current pipe right now that is I think 18 inch um possibly 24 inch but 24 just inch. one 24 inch yeah one pipe so that it's it definitely constricts flow um for storm events current and future and does not allow um aquatic and terrestrial wildlife resource area the only difference um is between pot wine is there's no bordering land subject to flooding, um, but there is natural heritage mapping at the Middle Street location. Um, culvert design, very similar. Uh, the height 
is five and a half um, feet versus at pot line, it was, it was six. A lot of the design for the height and the size of this does have to do with where the sewer line is. Um, I think with pot line, we had said that the sewer line is actually gonna sit above the um, new culvert, but at Mill Street, the uh, culvert will sit, yeah, the sewer, the sewer line is gonna be underneath the um, culvert at Mill Street. So because of those sewer lines, the height did get affected. Um, but uh, basically very much the same uh, bank full width of 7.7 .7 within the culvert. Um, pass it to terrestri terrestrial benches of 0 0.9 feet, openness ratio 0 0.95, um, bank full measurements with the H&H &H study uh, showed that it should be at least 9.24, have a span of 9.24, we've got 9.5, um, and it's sitting on an, a 12 inch crushed stone pad, similar to pot wine. Um, so really not mm, any differences here except the heights, but everything else, the river material will be the same. Structure will basically be the same. Um, we've got um, a little bit different of a design here. The, the scouring area is a little bit bigger. The constructed scour pads on either end are gonna be a little bit bigger. We've got some, um, we've got this little stone leak off here and we've got the um, turf reinforcement matting, which I think Laura can talk about the purpose of those two, but those are things that were not a pot wine that are included in this design. In terms of stormwater, um, at this site, I think I have a picture of it, I do. This is a stormwater pipe that currently comes out on the upstream side of the current culvert on the north bank um, and discharges stormwater that 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 comes all the way down Middle Street. There's a there's a swale on the side of Middle Street for quite a ways that comes out here. And also there's catch basins on um South Orchard Road, I think it's called or South Orchard Drive that drain to this stormwater outfall. So it gets quite a bit of flow. Um, so for stormwater improvements for this project, we're cutting this pipe off like 15 or so feet um, to the north and putting in, let's go back here, putting in a new um, drainage manhole so that we have access um, for cleaning out that drainage line and then HDPE piping and then a, um, a flared end, again, away from the bank um to to dissipate the energy of the flow um and improve so there's less erosion and just improve that basic stormwater outfall situation and again i have we have details on that if people want to see them i have the plans and we can look at the details if we want um resource area protection and dewatering is the same as pot wine Basically, we got the same erosion control. Um, here's our dewatering settling basin. Coffer dams, same 24 inch ATP bypass piping. Yep. Thanks, Fred. Okay, uh, Commissioner comments on this one. And if there's any public comments, please raise your hand. Jason. I would just copy my same comments from the last one regarding scour protection. Yep. Thanks, Jason. Alex. Similar project, uh, comment as before, and we talked about in the field, uh, where this culvert's going in, there is a long downhill on Middle Street coming from the north, and then there's a long downhill coming from Bay Road. And the road is, the headwall is probably three feet below the, the top of the head wall is probably three feet below the road. And the road is engineered so that all that water coming down the road goes directly into the brook, including all the sand that's put on in the wintertime. And so I asked Beth if this could be designed to prevent sand from going into the stream from the road. Just so it's the same comment as on the other culvert. 
and she thought that that might be uh, something that they could work into the design. Yeah, Lara, maybe can you comment on the um, so the reason this little have, stone yeah. leak off and the, so that, that stuff. Yeah, that's very similar to what um, I can't remember. I think Rachel commented on the last one about having some sort of stone um, at the road. So on the on this picture, so it's the southern side on the left. Uh, there is an existing drainage drainage sewer pipe coming into the into the into the creek, but on the north there's not. So trying to memorialize that flow rate so it's not just rushing into um, and like eroding away at the bank. Um, so that's kind of the purpose of that of that leak off on the northern part on the right. Um, so I think that would help with sand filtration in the in the winter. And, but again, that's, that's rip wrapped. So I'm not sure how the commission feels about adding that. It would certainly help with slowing down and capturing sand prior to, to entering. We could absolutely add it if that's something that you're interested in doing. Is so you're there... talking, um, can I respond? Yes. Sure. Um, so you're talking about the storm runoff pipe. Uh, no, so there is no, this. yeah, so there is no pipe to the north. Um, there is no sewer coming, or sorry, pipe coming in to the creek from the north. It's just country drainage. And so putting that leak off, putting that, that riprap stone there, it's kind of memorializing something so it doesn't cause erosion into the creek. I thought that, I thought that pipe on the East on the up, upstream side, north and north side of the stream was stormwater. Anyways, that's it, coming from the south, um, or it's come. That's the north. This is the sorry. south. Sorry, coming from the <laughs> north. Thank you, Beth. So the <laughs> area coming from the north has the has this the manhole, as it does today. It doesn't have a manhole, but it's coming straight into the creek. And then the area from the south doesn't have anything today. Um, and so putting in some best practices, adding the adding the leak off yeah so what i was commenting on is sheet water from the street mm -hmm. and there's a i'm not sure that it i mean like the storm today the streets were just full and um a lot of fast moving water and i was wanted to make sure that we're not directing that water from the street into the stream uh, with all the sand with it, that's different than managing the stormwater pipe and its discharge. Um, the the this culvert will be the low point in the road for hundreds of yards on either side, um, and I just wanted to put a, frankly put a stop to the sand that DPW puts on the road in the wintertime, winding up in the stream. That's a that's a form of fill. <clears throat> then exactly. also, I I think Erin's gonna she's got her hand up, but I think she's gonna talk about scour uh, issues on the southern on the discharge side of this on the west side of the street. Yeah, so Aaron, why don't you go comment, ahead? Your comment about um, riprap uh, doesn't yeah. address water from the street. There's that's the picture right there, but that doesn't address water from the street and sand. Okay, so that was a comment for both of these projects is addressing the sheet flow right. and the sand that could get in there. Um, and what have I done? Yeah, um, Aaron, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I was just um, on a on a recent project where we did a uh, a stream restoration, a very similar culvert um, uh, restoration project, stream restoration project where there was a 90 degree bend right at the outlet of the um, of the pipe um, where the stream came under the the road where it makes that 90 degree bend it it started carving out the right of way and we ended up having to issue an emergency certification to um, I'm just going to draw in here for a second. The water basically came out and then just circles right back and starts carving away at this location. Um, and it uh, it did this on a project recently. And we just were observing while we were out there that this was already happening. And there was there was um, 
like whirlpools happening in the um in this this little um basin here so it was just a, a comment that uh it's a concern that you know when they get in there and they start working that um there there could potentially be issues with that so just something to consider that we might want to um, add additional armoring um, in that area just in case that happens. Thanks, Aaron. Jason? Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to Alex's comment and then the stone leak offs. Um, I think there was a little bit of confusion. Laura was mentioning this. I was a little confused. The stormwater pipe and, and the leak offs we were talking about, it seems like two of those. Um, I want to make sure those stone leak offs, they're designed to the top portion of them right next to the road is riprap, correct? Yes. And yes. then where it says there's the turf reinforcement matting, that's going to be the, the TRM with, it's going to be seated over top of the TRM. Yes. And then that is just designed to effectively slow water down as it comes off of the road. So you're designing those cuts essentially in the road, filling them with riprap, and they slowly will uh, act, they'll act as weirs to slowly allow water to flow down that vegetated yes. channel. They're going to be channelized as well. They're not going to be. They're not channeled. It's just it, the, the TRM is there to prevent erosion, prevent scour later on. Um, but the okay, idea so is for it to be shaped. flat. No. Okay. All right. Okay, so that would that would go potentially once the water hits that, that rip rap, it'll slow down and potentially drop out some of that sand. Yeah, and some of that vegetation might pull some of that sand out of the water as well as it slows down. Um, you know, a, a potential is there potential on this project and on pot wine to do like. Um, uh, like weirs going down a series of like drop weirs instead of drop weirs we could do um i just don't know if it's the right place to put it but you could do coir logs you know or vegetated soil lifts down i wouldn't do coir logs because they're gonna build the grade eventually yeah I'm i think thinking that's... more of stone like plunge pools this is a very small area. I would say that there's probably not enough space to do punch pools here. Um, okay. I would I think, think, I mean, to me, this this is probably a good solution, but uh, just, the, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because I was a little confused when we were talking about the pipe. I know, I, I'm sorry, I got and, north and south confused and boy, that took everyone from a wrong turn. Um, uh, but yeah. if this is acceptable, we could propose these leak offs and turf reinforcement matting with vegetation underneath them and through them um, for both both projects. And it would be an inexpensive, easy to maintain, um, something that DPW could carry on with and make sure it's working appropriately. And it would help with sand. All right, thank you. Okay, so that was another one for the list. Um, Alex, maybe we can- hey, Just coming back keep from- going. Oh, Am I on mute? Nope. No, no. I'm um, just coming back. I I didn't hear any solutions suggested, and uh, um, I don't. I just wanted to throw out the idea of a berm uh, or a curb along over the culvert to direct water from the road to the vegetated sideline, so that it doesn't go. I, I'm looking for some suggestions. Uh, maybe Rachel has one, or Beth, or. Or Laura. Yeah, and, and we don't need to figure this out all tonight because we're going to continue this. So I think maybe because we're getting on in the time, posing these, having our list that we can make sure we communicate with and then revisiting these at the next meeting is probably the best way forward at this point. Yeah, yeah I all, think we can... With all due respect, they, uh, we just had a discussion about solutions for the stormwater pipe. I'm just asking for a word or two on what's on their mind about the issue I've raised. Okay, Laura, do you have any off-the-cuff ideas on that one? Sure. I think if we curb it, we may see more ponding on the road, so we'd want to avoid that. Um, I could absolutely add uh, what we would call leak-offs, like what we're calling right now, but it's just 
you know, it's riprap along the road, maybe the whole entire way around the culvert. And then we just make sure that we have some TRM, so it's turf reinforcement matting and it's vegetated and that slips down to, um, to the wing wall and around. And that way it, it catches the sand and it's also vegetated. So it's got a small bit of, it's not all rocked and armored. We can include some vegetation. Yeah, that's, that sand is a, is a form of fill. So go okay. ahead. Um, Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think um, Laura, something like that, um, Sounds like something that, I mean, that's a standard thing in the Massachusetts stormwater standards too, as a stone diaphragm, kind of what you described that can be cleaned out along the length that could be acceptable. Um, okay. I just had one other common observation on site. You know, we do have the beaver beaver activity up, up upstream and um, the town has done a great job of installing some, some beaver deceivers and other things to help manage them while they're managing the water. But we did notice that the, the stream is very, very braided. Um, it looks like it's moving around a lot and meandering a lot. And um, I talked with um, Beth Uggs and um, Aaron on site, just concern about the foul egg underneath the culvert with that uh, sandy kind of material. Um, and with something with a stream that wants to meander and move around that there may be challenges managing that material long-term and as you know, where it's the town and, and you guys are good engineers, we're gonna be keeping an eye on it and, and, and sort of addressing things in the field, but just noting that this might be a, a challenging one to manage that material that's in the culvert. And as Aaron mentioned, the, um, the right-hand turn creating an eddy that's gonna be tending to scour and um, change, change the morphology of, of that system is gonna be a little bit challenging, I think. Okay. Um, I will say that we are doing uh, scour countermeasures through the culvert as well as part of the substrate, um, which will be helpful for that. Thinking about like you've got at least one, the first foot to 18 inches, that'll be pretty well armored. And then the stream substrate that you put in above it can meander and move around um, as is happening with the, is it upstream or downstream that you were seeing the braided channel? Upstream. Upstream. Okay. Okay. Is that because of the dam upstream? It's Isn't mostly because a... of, I think, because of, of the beaver activity in the yeah. end. You know, the beaver activity really did hold water back between uh, Middle Street all the way back to that giant beaver dam that's back there. And so then almost affected the stream, the stream channel by, mm -hmm. by holding water back like that multiple times. So then right. you have kind of this this not as much of a, a, a form, real form channel. It's actually coming back now that we put the beaver, now that conservation put the beaver deceiver in and you're getting sort of a constant flow within a channel. It seems to be uh, forming it again. And certainly downstream, there's a very um, formed channel. Hmm. Good thoughts. Um, thanks, Rachel. Okay. Um, there were a lot of items. So I think we've touched on all of them. I've been watching you take notes, Laura. Is there anything you need clarification on? Or maybe you could check in with Aaron and me and just um, make sure we got everything covered to, so we can address it at the next meeting. Yep. Does that yep. sound like a plan to everybody? Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, great. Thank you. Um, in that case, we're looking to a motion to continue this one. And I move that we condition. I don't have the language in front of me. So move to continue the public hearing for Middle Street Culvert Replacement DEP number 089-0737 to 522-24 at 735. So moved. Second. Okay, so that was Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. I want, okay. to thank, I want to thank Beth for a very informative uh, site visit. She was terrific. Thanks, You're welcome. Beth. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Thanks. All right. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night. All right. Okay. So next up, we have um, 
Notice of intent for Karen Environmental Consulting LLC on behalf of LLSE Bornax LLC and WD Coles Incorporated for the construction of a battery storage system associated access road improvements and stormwater management within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Montague Road, Route the 63, Map 2A, Lot 18. So, so they're continuing to work on um, some plan updates. So this is going to be continued. Um, it'd be my preference just to move to continue this, given that we have a lot more to address on our agenda tonight. Um, I move that we continue the public hearing for uh, the Montague Road Battery Storage Project DEP number 089-0731 to 612-24 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Alex on the motion and Jason on the second. Rachel? Abstain. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Abstain. Am and I. Okay. Um... All right, next up, hearing number five, we have Berkshire Design Group and NOI on behalf of Emily Dickinson Museum for the construction of a historic carriage house and associated site work in the buffer zone to bordering vegetate the wetlands at 214 Main Street, Map 14B, Lot 26. Okay, and we have some folks here for that tonight. Erin, are you bringing people in? Okay. Um, all right, so we had a pretty long discussion last meeting. And there's been some revisions to the plan, some plan aspects. Um, Aaron, do you want to give us a five minute update? Sure. So after the last call, I met with Chris um, and gave him some recommendations in terms of plan adjustments. Um, and so he he incorporated those plan adjustments and um, provided a, a plan um, revision back to me. I do feel that he is. Um, addressed the lion's share of the commission's comments uh, with the um, proposal and also reflective mm -hmm. of a four to one mitigation rate on the site um, for the for the mitigation area. So I think that um, it's pretty well um, addressing a lot of the commission's comments and um, I'll otherwise yield my time to Chris to sort of present what his plan adjustments were. Thanks, Aaron. Welcome, Chris. Um, welcome, Jane. Chris, do you want to give us an update? Sure. We'll pull the plan up here. Um, as Aaron mentioned, um, we've updated the plans um, to sort of clarify and specify the various um, mitigation measures based on the comments that we've gathered through a couple of site visits and uh, meetings with the commission. Um, and these are primarily reflected on this new sheet C301 that was included um, in a submission that we made last week that I think made the packets. Um, and so really the intent here was to ensure, you know, not just for the commission's benefit, but this will also be beneficial for the contractor eventually doing the work to um, coherently summarize um, all of the mitigation and restoration work that is proposed in the project. Um, and those are, uh, and so in, Sorry, trying to figure out a zoom here. Um, and so we have um, pulled the sheet together. There are sort of um, three really, oh, actually four distinct areas um, here, uh, which identify um, this portion of the site, which is generally the, the currently heavily vegetated, a little bit more naturalized area split between um, actual wetland proper and inner buffer area with these two hatches, which we're showing as mitigation area, um, which is primarily focused on the invasive species that we've been discussing, as well as the native plantings that we're putting in. Uh, we've got a second area, which we're referring to as restoration area, which is the area that is currently, you know, lawn in air quotes, but is in reality a, a fairly bare um, uh, and also includes a lot of the mature uh, Japanese tree lilac that we are looking at and are concerned with. And then um, the last area is um, additional 50 foot wetland buffer that is not slated for specific restoration area and is really the, the core of the actual project site, which does have a few relevant ele elements to it. Um, and the 
the summary is really in this set of notes here where we go through nine points um, of this mitigation restoration work. A couple of the ones at the bottom are really just blanket requirements, um, um, but to, to go through them as briefly as I can um, and, and just a summary of everything that, that we're at here. Uh, number one is really, you know, probably the most significant one is removal of the Japanese tree lilac, which is identified as a non-native species that's taking over um, this resource area, not officially invasive, but it's essentially acting as an invasive species in this uh, site. Um, and so uh, the strategy there is to cut the mature trees. The museums agreed that we'll cut all of the mature Japanese tree lilac that is within the 50 foot buffer. Um, those would be cut and treated with an herbicide to make sure they don't grow back. Additional cutting of suckers as they come up um, and treating of those to keep those down. Um, and as you recall, that, that's what we really think is sort of raining seeds um, into the wetland and inner buffer areas. Um, and based on the research, uh, this tree doesn't spread vegetatively. It doesn't really creep, but uh, if, if seeds make it, um, drop into naturalized areas, they are able to take over, which is what we're seeing in there. Um, additionally, the smaller uh, saplings uh, and, and uh, just sprouting trees would be removed primarily manually to the extent that that's feasible. Um, some of those larger saplings are probably um, uh, best to be cut and treated because they're unlikely to actually be able to be pulled uh, in a couple of cases. Um, and we are stating a preference for cut stem and dabbing or painting an herbicide on those plants. Um, however, uh, you know, in, in comes, uh, conversation with Aaron, uh, it sounds like it's it's been the experience of the commission with certain species um, that the the license applicator comes through and says, well, that the um, the direct application of the herbicide is not always the best case. And I think Michelle, when you were out there, you had mentioned that it may be necessary to, to be spraying just because of the extent of the tree lilac. So we're leaving that open as a possibility. And as I'll mention down below, specifying sp um, specifically an herbicide that's approved for aquatic ecosystems and having a preference for not spraying, but using that if, if it is um, uh, deemed the most likely to be successful in targeting the species. Um, so number two is removal of other invasive species. Um, at the very least, I've observed bittersweet that's starting to come up, possibly a little honeysuckle. I'm not great at plant ID, um, but uh, you know the Japanese tree lilac is what we're most concerned with because that's really kind of colonized out there. Um, but we will also um, be targeting um, other invasive species as encountered, and specifically the mitigation method there defers to um, published recommendations from a state, ideally Massachusetts, although in my experience, we found better, uh, we found any information more readily in, in a couple of the neighboring states um, and using that as the basis of guideline um, really for any invasive species that are encountered as we move along. Um, three is the follow-up work. Um, so we are committing to two subsequent years of additional removal. I think I, I used the word maintenance and there was some exception taken to that, that, that we're really looking at uh, removing um, additional species that are popping up, which was the intent um, when we were making those comments earlier. Um, essentially those same procedures that are listed for the tree lilac and the invasive species to go back in, in year two and year three um, to uh, do that work again to ensure we really tamp that down and, and give the chance for the native plants to move in. Um, item four is the delineation of mitigation restoration areas. And these are actually um, shown, we, we have found what, what we think is actually a really good um, uh, way to do this in a way that's gonna be acceptable to the museum. So I've highlighted uh, seven, I think it's seven, maybe six locations that I'll point out here where we are going to have driven rebar with, uh, with permanent caps attached to them that end up flush to grade. Um, and for anyone who reviewed the plan, uh, you may have been confused about the citation of this detail, um, uh, which you know, I didn't even put the correct plan set in here. Um, I had a computer crash just as I was finishing this plan set up. Um, and was um, uh, didn't notice that the detail had been dropped in the signed plan set that I sent Erin, which perhaps she can bring up in a minute if we want to see what those look like. Um, we should have detail of those. But uh, we've I found a product that is actually for survey markers uh, that 
fit uh, snugly and permanently onto the end of a piece of rebar. It's an aluminum disc and we can order them at reasonable cost and actually custom engrave them with language. So we can specifically identify this as a restoration area and note no leaf blowing, which is the key concern um, or other ground disturbance. And we can imprint that text directly on those medallions, uh, which would then be lined on this area here so that as maintenance is coming through, uh, those will be flush with the surface. If they're leaf blowing, they're going to uncover them and it's going to immediately tell them that they should not be leaf blowing beyond this area. Um, so I felt that that was a, a, a nice way to do it in a way that will be very nondescript and you know doesn't conflict with some of the museum's other goals for this area. Um, we've added notes about the preservation of the trout lily soils, um, essentially asking the contractor to scoop up uh, that upper portion of the topsoil and segregate that from the other um, excavation that's occurring um, during the sewer work, and then to replace that on the top and to gently um, uh, uh, press that back down into place uh, when it's done to try to preserve as much uh, of the trout lily that's in the path of that work as possible. I will note that being out there, um, and I took, I think it may have been Bruce's suggestion or Alex's suggestion, I'm not sure, um, to go and flag that. I've actually gone and put flags around that area so that a couple of months down the road when the lily, lilies are not present anymore, um, I've got written on there. Uh, on those flags where those are. So we'll be able to identify that. Um, but also walking out there, that colony is e more extensive than we even realized the first day we're out there. There's a ton of it out there. Um, so I, I think there's going to be no oh. doubt that that's going to make a, a strong comeback when we're all done here. Um, replacement trees, uh, in light of the fact that the Japanese tree lilac, which while it's acting as native, are still, um, uh, you know, large shade, not large, but but significant shade trees in this area uh, will be coming down. Uh, we've increased the number of uh, native trees that we're going to replace um, from a list of either tulip, black walnut, or white oak. Um, we have identified three areas in this restoration area where a lot of those uh, tree lilac are going to come down, as well as the originally proposed location um, here. So that's four total trees. We've left a little bit of wiggle room in the notes so that um, uh, Jane uh, and the contractor can work out areas that won't disturb anything else that may not be picked up on this survey um, and can make sure that the layout is historically appropriate and works with the site. But um, the, as per the notes, they would all be required to be in the buffer and the intention is to have three of them in this restoration area which is uh, now going to lose um, some trees uh, and tree cover there. And then there's the native shrub planting. We had originally proposed low bullish bush blueberry as part of our site visit. It was identified that, that perhaps viburnum uh, would be a better species that would end up growing in more significantly um, and, and which should be well suited to this area. Um, so these dark circles of which there are eight are spread out in the areas where we are probably going to lose a lot of vegetation when we take out the Japanese tree lilac um, to fill those in with the more significant shrubs. And we've identified uh, three um, uh, native varieties of that um, to choose from, depending on availability, or we may do a mix of them to, to mix them together. Uh, and then two other provisions was with the herbicide, um, again, stating that the herbicide is only for the purposes of er er eradicating the tree lilac and other invasive species, uh, that it be certified for aquatic ecosystems, um, and that there's a uh, preference for uh, a more controlled method of adding it, but if a licensed applicator um, uh, suggests and we approve that that spraying may be appropriate uh, uh, means. Um, and then we just added a note about the permanent stabilization, uh, which was always the intention. I think this is in our planting plan already, but it's summarized here that in the mitigation and restoration areas, which is this entire north portion, um, disturbance uh, such as there is land disturbance would be um, reseeded with a native conservation mix from um, Amherst wetland, or, um, excuse me, from Amherst wetland plants. Um, and then that this area, which is really part of the main site would be um, stabilized uh, with traditional turf grass to, to match the remainder of the site. Um, and so, you know, with all of those in total, um, 
the areas of improvement uh, was summarized in this location, as well as the area of the, the permanent impacts to the site. Uh, and uh, based on that work, we're anticipating a ratio of over four to one of the area mitigated versus the impacted area. Um, and so uh, what we're presenting is what we feel is the best feasible plan that we can bring forward. Um, and that, you know, the improvements to the buffer um, are, in our opinion, uh, we would suggest are um, significantly outweigh the impacts uh, on a site that is heavily disturbed in the existing condition, uh, which would meet the intent of the uh, local bylaw. Um, so with that, happy to, to take uh, any questions. Thanks, Chris. That was great. And very thorough. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand now and I'll keep an eye on the room. Um, I'm just going to jump in with a couple of comments. Um, let's see. I really like your solution with the medallion, if that's what you call it. Um, that was very creative wow. and great. Um, I did notice that not the entire perimeter of the mitigation wow. restoration area is demarcated and I, I would like to see that northern and western boundary um, have some pins and since it's off the like historic um, site maybe they could not be totally flush with the ground but be more visible for for people um, working in that area so that they would be able to see it and just keeping with the same um, engravings that you had for the other design so um yeah maybe not just maybe the corners and the midpoints um just because it's not really obvious what's going on on that end of it outside the emily dickinson house area um another thing was in our order of conditions we have so just to back up for the context since we're talking about a permanent impact to this buffer area within the 50 foot notice verb I, I'd also like to have some assurances that we're talking about permanent or as long as we can uh, mitigation. And I, in our order of conditions, we have for the life of the project is the language we're using for the management of the mitigation area. But I see that in your points, it's uh, there's like a three year maintenance period. So we had talked about, um, I think that was related to sort of the ecology of that plant, but given the juxtaposition of this place with other places in town, I can see bittersweet coming in there within five years and totally overrunning all the work that you're talking about. So I think it's going to require a for the life of the project language um, for maintenance in this. So it's just going to be sort of part of the ground maintenance is to be pulling bittersweet and other invasives. So um, making that language in this plan consistent with the order of conditions. And then lastly, I think it would be useful to maybe have some kind of sign off or a letter from your contractor or landscaper acknowledging the uh, naturalized area that they just know that it's there because if they're not looking for it, it could be easy to overlook. So just that there's some line of communication and acknowledgement um, that that's now part of the practice and the, the operations person um, knows what's going on too. So those are my comments. Um, I'll just I'll just we'll gather everybody's comments and maybe we can come back to you. Andrea, go ahead. You're at the top of my list. Yeah. Uh, when you were uh, Chris, when you 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 guys have done a, a really good job of uh, putting this together and 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 finding solutions when uh, when we hit these bumps. Um, I did have a question about uh, the Japanese. Um, lilac you mentioned the uh, cutting the i think you said one tree that was on the uh in the resource area plus any streamers etc uh, did i get that right um there are among mature trees i think i counted uh perhaps 12 of them uh clustered in this area and along um, the edge here, talking about really, you know, mature ones. Um, and then there are a number of, you know, call it five, five or eight year growth, uh, especially clustered in this area. Uh, there's a, it gets a lot thinner out here as we get further away from the mature trees. And then there are baby trees all over the place um, throughout this, this area. Okay, and and then uh, so what you're looking to do is cut them all. Is that correct uh, within the resource area? 
uh, within, yes, yeah, so within the 50 foot buffer. And uh, as far as I can tell, there's nothing, uh, there may not be any in the wetland proper, but to the extent that there is at the edges, the, the intention is to eradicate them as much as we possibly can. Obviously, there's there's some of them are are brand new, and it's going to be you know difficult to get them all the first go round. But you know, with the follow up maintenance, sure. we should um, pretty much get all of it. Okay. Um, uh, so then, the last question I have, uh, and just something for thought: uh, Are there any other um, Japanese uh, lilacs on the property outside of the zone that the area that you're looking to cut them? And yes, if so, you said yeah. that they do rain their seeds uh, down, uh, perhaps the uh, part of that, you know, perhaps you guys take them all down to avoid um, having that uh, issue. Yeah. And so that's something we've discussed, actually. Um, and so I'll, I'll tell you everything that's come up about it. Um, <laughs> A, we absolutely do not want to remove all of them from the property because they were actually one of the favored plants by the Dickinson family. Um, mm. So uh, that would be a hard sell. Um, based on my research, the reason why these things haven't been cited as invasive species yet is they tend not to get out in most places because just the nature of where they tend to be planted is in the middle of maintained areas. As long as you're mowing around them, those seeds are very heavy and they drop in place and they don't go anywhere. Um, so they, they don't move unless they have access to an unmaintained area and then they can outcompete the native vegetation that's there. So we do feel like um, you know, there's nothing in this area that I readily identified. Um, I think there is some, as we move down into this portion of the site and further away from the resource area, that all have quite a lot of mowed lawn around it. So we really would not expect to see those um, continue to create issues. Well, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Andre. Mm -hmm. Alex? Yeah. Thanks very much, Chris. And and uh, Jane Wald for the work on this. I'd like to come back to an issue I talked about last time, and that's a tree that you wanna take out where this building's gonna be located. And uh, it's a large tree, very mature. It's, I'm, I didn't measure it, but I'm guessing that it's about 18 inches in diameter or more. And uh, I just wanna say, if you take that tree out, it's going to worsen the water problem that you have in the evergreens because of evapotranspiration uh, benefit that it now gives you won't be there anymore. Uh -huh. And so taking it out, you will increase your water problem associated with the river evergreens. Um, the last time we talked about this, I asked if we could move that building over 10 feet or so to save that tree. And uh, with all due respect to Jane Wald, I did call a friend of mine that I used to work with who knows a lot about uh, uh, the National Historic uh, Properties. He worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, knew that stuff backwards and forwards for the National Wildlife Refuge System. And I asked her if there's some flexibility because what I was told was there was no flexibility and their comment was there's always flexibility. So I'm going to come back with a pro-life uh, kind of a request for that big tree. And um, um, it's within the 50 foot, uh, 30 foot, I think it is, but it's certainly within the 50 foot, yep, um, that you plan to take out. And I again, I'm going to ask if you could move that building over to save that tree, which uh, has lots of benefits to you. Alex, do you think that removing that, I mean, if they move the building, they're still cutting pretty deep and close to that root system. And I wonder if that would, in fact, save a tree. That's just my thoughts on that. I um, would, it's a, it, if they could move it out from underneath the drip edge of that tree, I, you know, I think DPW comes pretty close to trees, but it, right now that tree comes out because of where the, it's not marked on this plan that he has in front of us right now. It's right here. Oh, okay. Um, um, okay, where well, your hand is, yep. that black dot. Yes, that's the yeah. trunk of it. The, you know, we don't necessarily survey the drip line, but we estimate it based on the, the size of the tree. So this is where we would estimate the drip line of the tree is. 
Well, a tree that size could probably, I mean, they're, they, their roots get close to the surface when they get older, they do get sensitive, but it would probably not die if a, some of it was taken. But if the tree, if the building could get moved over, I was guessing 10 feet. I didn't, I didn't stand under the tree and figure out the drip line, but you deem you do, you do have flexibility under the rules. And so I would ask that, um, since you are almost 100% within the 50 foot line for this building that you add saving the tree to your mitigation plan. Okay, um, thanks Alex. Um, I think I'm going to take a poll with the commissioners. Um, let's see, um, who would like to move forward with the current mitigation plan? Uh, raise your hand and keep your hand down specifically if you'd like to uh, revisit this with a, the moving of the building um, to save the tree. So all in favor of current mitigation plan, which does include the removal of the tree in the current um, location of the building, raise your hand. Can I take notes? Take notes on what? Who's raising their hand? Oh. Um, okay, I see a majority, Alex. Um, I mean, I appreciate personally that we, to save the mature trees, I'm also seeing that they're planting long-lived other native species. And for me, that's, that um, sort of compensates for that. Um, so I think given that we have the majority in support of moving forward with this current mitigation plan that you Unfortunately, and the tree are in the minority there. Um, okay, so so given that, any other comments, commissioners, um, that would allow us to move forward tonight? With all due respect, you uh, didn't give Jane Wald an opportunity to respond before you asked for a show of hands. What what exactly would you like her to respond to? Just uh, because we want to keep this moving. You've already asked for a show of hands without asking for uh, a response so i just wanted yeah. to point that out i mean i assume that she that if push came to shove they could move that building like i but i don't but i don't need to i'm and, happy and moving just, forward just to this. speak for the project as a whole we are not offering to move the building yeah can i can i, can I respond michelle please do so um i, I really want to make a request here to try and keep the hearings to a limited time frame um because it feels like we're giving sort of undue process to certain hearings um in amherst so i don't know if it's robert's rules or what bringing things to a vote earlier um but um it seems as though this discussion you know we, we can really expedite things so um we don't have to discuss it now but want to definitely make a note for the future yeah well every hearing is different and requires response um and I'm trying. So I That's, think that was not that was not a dig at you, Michelle, I promise. <laughs> OK, um, I have made three asks about this project that I would like to see be incorporated into the mitigation plan. And I think you wrote those down, Chris. So... I did. Um, and those seem quite reasonable. I think we have we have no objection to those. I guess we, we might want to specify as to what that maintenance for the life of the project will actually entail so that we're clear on what what that effort will be yeah so if i was to explain that very simply it would be that you now have a naturalized native area that is under the operation and management of the emily dickinson property so just as you maintain the shrubs and the lawn as everything else you now have this section in which you have a sort of a different maintenance plan is which is those plants should remain native, it should remain in the natural state that we're trying to describe here and keep it in perpetuity or for the life of that building. Um, so the point is that if you're proposing that mitigation, that that mitigation stays as long as that building does. And that's the concession we're making here. Uh, so does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I think as long as it's, it's sort of a routine, you know, check up on it and that if we see invasive species moving in, that we're going to go and, and mitigate those in accordance with proper 
guidance that we're ensuring that the the plantings that we've put in um, are are continuing to to succeed um, as part of a routine thing. I, I just wanted to to be clear because this will be in in the deed permanently, and so I wouldn't want some future commission thinking that you know uh, that at all times all traces of invasive species should be absent from the site uh, or, yeah. or anything like that. So that's Understood. why I just want to be clear. I think that we discussed ratios. So, I mean, 80% native, like um, it's small enough that that could be pretty easily surveyed, but maybe that that's kind of the benchmark that you're going for. So then you know when to intervene. Is that acceptable? Um, yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's helpful um, to, to have it clear. Um, and that, that creates trigger points as opposed to sort of a, an open-ended obligation. Okay. All right, so um, those additions, okay, so can we make this motion as is or do we need to um, include, um, okay, with noted additional conditions? Are we good to go? You're on mute, Aaron. So I would say the, the additional noted conditions that I have here are that we're going to maintain 80% natives in perpetuity in the, in the um, mitigation area, that there are going to be um, additional um, uh, boundary markers at the corners of the mitigation area that aren't cur currently and marked. And the center points. And the, and the center points, halfway points on the on the um, straightaways. Uh, can and I just pause there and say that the midpoint here would be directly in the middle of the wetland, and is that really what we want? Okay, where does the lawn start? Um. So we, I mean, so this would be the corner of our restoration area, uh, and then this is all pretty much naturalized the whole run. Okay. Well, if, if that's, in. yeah, then I guess the corners, if it's not feasible on that Western part, I am, I'm looking at the different hashtagging. So if you can fit it, maybe not at the midway. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, I, I think this, this side's no problem, but I'm, I'm just looking at eyeballing it. It would be about there and I wouldn't want to send someone tromping through the middle of that area to, to drive something in the ground. Okay. That's fine with me. Okay. So approximate locations along the measurement, not in the wetland. And then yeah. um, uh, some type of uh, written um, acknowledgement from the landscape company that they're aware of the um, uh, maintenance requirements within the mitigation area um, over the course of time that, you know, whomever that landscaper is would identify that they're aware of those areas. Okay. Those are the conditions that I have that are in addition to the current drafted um, order of conditions. Can you guys see my screen when I share? Because for whatever reason, it seems like you can't. All I can see is Chris's screen. Okay. Uh, I don't know why me, it's not. I can, um, I can see it. Oh, You can see you my can screen? See hers. Yeah, I can see hers. I can see it now. Uh -huh. Seems like some people could see. I was sharing photos earlier and it seemed like you guys couldn't see them. Okay, so here's the motion. So as long as we, um, on the record, we've already identified the additional conditions, which seem acceptable. And I I think um, just to, to clarify um, in terms of, uh, so uh, in terms of how current ground maintenance actually works at the museum to make sure that, that we're in alignment with how the museum actually operates, because I'm, uh, getting a, a note from Jane about landscape companies. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think I've got to uh, ask her to to just chime in a little bit on on how current maintenance of the grounds works and who does it. Um, and you're muted. Yeah, the it's, uh, recently undergone a change in the way its landscape is is managed. Um, at times, Amherst College is a, a manager of landscape, and at other times, um, into, uh, other vendors, outside vendors are. Um, so I think uh, the, whatever mechanism uh, the commission wants, um, I, I, I'm not 100% sure it's going to be an agreement or a letter from a single landscape vendor. 
Do you have like a operations plan or a point of contact for this property? Who oversees the coordination with the landscapers? Uh, at this point, it is a partnership between me and uh, the head of grounds at the college. Um, I mean, this is why I wanted field identification because it, things can fall apart when somebody that doesn't know the area or the the intent goes on and they're just not going to notice. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm looking for ideas here. Like, the point is that this is maintained. So if you guys have an idea about how to clearly communicate that to whoever is going to be there at a given time across the years, like I'm open to hearing what that avenue is. Well, I I think it would be uh, a letter or agreement with the museum and not with a vendor that may change through the years. Okay. With And in that letter, it would specify that the museum is responsible for communicating with the vendor and the contractor, the landscaper, um, what the situation is. Because I think that if these pins are going to be flushed with the ground, they're going to be easily missed. And, you know, people are going to be busy doing landscaping and not really looking for this. So that's my concern. Dave, I see your hand up. Yeah, well, well um, can you hear me? I guess while I know these details are important, I, I am sensitive to the commission's time as Laura noted a few minutes ago, but to me, this strikes me, strikes, strikes me, it's really up to the applicant, to the owner, to the manager of the property to agree to this, whoever the landscaper is. So this is really an agreement in my mind between the operators of the Emily Dickinson Museum and the commission through this permit. So I, I, I just don't think we can predict five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. It strikes me as similar to, although this is not a conservation restriction, the owner of the property is responsible for the terms of the, con uh, upholding the terms of the conservation uh, restriction. So likewise, if you want this to run with the property, run with the deed, it really falls to uh, Jane currently and her staff to make sure that the whoever is doing the landscape, it be, being a private company or Amherst College, that they they adhere to that. And to some degree, the buck stops with the 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 operators of the museum. So I guess I I don't. Are we looking for something more than that? I'm just wondering. We we. I mean, I, I agree. I don't want to try and manage that communication to that level. Um, I was hoping it would be more simple. So I'll let you guys figure out what that line of communication is. I mean, I yeah. initially wanted something very clear in the field, but because of the the intent to keep it more historically um, you know, relevant, then we're, we worked all the way down to like a flush with the ground monument. So my only concern is that that's not going to be enough. So I'm happy to just leave it with you guys to figure out um, that communication and that we just are leaving it as is and maybe walk back that line of communication, but it's just expected that that will be a naturalized area and you can manage how that works, however is necessary. Michelle, can I make a comment? Yep. Yeah, I think my, my point, which was not eloquently spoken before, is I, I fully agree with Dave. We're making... Um, quite a few exceptions here, um, uh, more so than we we do in accordance with upholding our, our um, bylaw. And it doesn't seem like our problem to solve, even though I completely understand the spirit of what you're discussing, you know, because it goes out for a long time. It, it really seems like the onus is on um, the Emily Dickinson Museum to make sure all of our requirements are met, um, not on us to solve for them, so. Sure. I mean, I'm cognizant of the fact that um, we don't have like a full time person going out to check every year for the next years in perpetuity. Yeah. So I'm trying to buffer against just what's yeah. probably inevitable. OK, well, I'm happy to leave to you guys how you want to solve the problem of keeping that area natural. Um, I like the monuments and I think we're looking for a motion to close this and issue of our issue our order of conditions.
I will move to close the public hearing and issue order of conditions for 214 Main Street DEP number 089-0733 with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations with the noted additional conditions. Second that. Okay, we have Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Laura. Aye. Bruce. Welcome back, Bruce. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Rachel. Abstain. Andre. Aye. Alex. Nay. And I'm an I. Okay, Chris, thank you for working with us. Thank you for all that attention to the details. Thank you, Jane. Looking forward thank to you. seeing that place restored. Thank you all. Good night. Okay. All right, so. Hearing number six, abbreviated notice of resource area delineation, Pure Sky Development Incorporated on behalf of WD Coles Incorporated, represented by Goddard Consulting for the confirmation of resource area boundaries on site, limited to areas that fall within the 100 foot feet of the proposed solar installation at Shootsbury Road, map 9B, lots 11 and 12, and maps 9D, lots 27. Okay, so we, Aaron, I assume you're bringing people in. We have received the revised plans with the dates added um, and title changed. All dates are consistent throughout. So everything we've asked for on this um, map and NRAD have been addressed. So thank you for doing that. Um, Aaron, do you wanna give us a short update? Yeah, um, I just worked sort of behind the scenes to make sure that all the revision dates were included, that the title block of the plan includes the final revision date. Um, we have a, a stamp on there um, at this point. So, um, and I also updated the finding of fact as well as the um, form B to reflect the updated um, plan revision dates. So I believe at this point we, um, can issue the ORAD. Thanks, Erin. Corey, Tom, do you want to give us a five-minute update? We uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the board, for the record. Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson in Amherst. Uh, no, I think we, it's been a long night for you. I think Erin did a terrific job of explaining exactly what uh, we've done. And so, you know, we're happy to talk about it if you want, but I think this stage is just issue the ORAD and then, you know, we'll start the NOI process. Thanks, Tom. Um, okay. Uh, yes. If there's public comment, please raise your hand and I'll um, go to it. Okay. I see a caller in. I am allowing you to talk. Please state your name and your address and keep it to two minutes. Um, yes. Um, again, Vincent O'Connor, 175 Summer Street. Hey, Vincent, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm not, part of the reason I asked the question earlier was to be able to ask this question for this hearing. Um, which has to do with um, as the applicant proceeds. Please speak um, up. As the applicant proceeds, um, is it clear that the that the rainfall that is going to be used to create the um, stormwater runoff uh, um, Present, presentation is the rainfall data that you you articulated in, with regard to the hotline lane culverts. Um, I think it's pretty important. 
And I think it, probably the applicant should leave the hearing um, knowing what that is, um, what's expected, so we don't have a, a situation where some very substantial revisions might have to be made. Um, Yeah, thanks, Vincent. I'm just going to field that one. So that um, is probably more relevant for when we have an NOI and stormwater calculations in front of us. And tonight we're just addressing a resource area delineation. But it's pretty standard practice um, to use forecasting for you know actual um, model climate change appropriate rainfall data. And I don't think that we ever encounter anything that isn't using that now because everybody okay. is pretty okay. um, certain that that just won't work. So um, yeah, please keep posted on the progress of this um, of this project and um, you can bring your question back when it's um, when it's the NOI. but, but yes, standard standard operating procedure at this point for stormwater planning. Um, okay, thank 7. you. Point, Seven point eight three for now and future. You know, twenty seventy is is eleven. That's that's the standard that that you're expecting to be used in any um, presentation, future presentation. Um. Okay, just very quickly, and I won't dwell on this, but there's different models that can be used, so I don't know that those are going to be the exact ones that are going to come up in this NOI, but um, we will be reviewing it um, thoroughly to just make sure that everyone's on board with which models and which resources are being used for that. For that. But don't yeah. stick to those numbers specifically because it's very likely not to be those. That's all I want to be clear about. Okay. And how would we be informed as to what which numbers will be used and why? Um, well, I guess our materials will be posted as public materials for a meeting. So once the NOI has been posted, you could review those or have other people, you know, review them and come back to the meeting and we could discuss it then. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't see any other comments. Commissioners, questions, comments? Jason. Yeah, I I would like to seek some clarification. This we're saying this is Shootsbury Road, map nine B, lots eleven twelve, map nine D, lot twenty-seven, but what appears to be labeled very largely 9B-11 and 9B-12, it says they are not included in this study. And I'm curious as to if I am reading something wrong or why those areas weren't included in this study. Karen, do you want to field that one? Um. So, and... Uh would defer to the applicant on some level if, if I am misspeaking, but what I understand is there are certain areas of the property where the project footprint is not um, going to be located. And so they're, um, they've only delineated areas that are relevant to the project footprint um, that they believe is necessary to confirm uh, to permit the project. Um, so they're there may be additional areas, and, and those are the areas that the commission had highlighted on the plan, I believe, that are in like a hatched location. And then we also had them add a study area boundary as well to designate the limits of that study area so that we could clearly differentiate the areas where the study actually took place and where resource areas had been confirmed, and then the areas that had not been studied as part of the um, ANRAD process. Yeah, that's exactly correct. And then um, it, when Aaron is mentioning confirmed, that was those were the areas that were peer reviewed. So it wasn't it wasn't just um, information sent from us. It was uh, double checked by a peer reviewer from the the town, Mrs. Stockman. Thanks. Um, I'm seeing another public comment. Um, okay, I'll just. Jenny Kellick, two minutes, please. 
Okay, good evening. Jenny Kalick, 147 Shootsbury Road. Was looking for a clarification about the intermittent stream at the entrance to the site. At the ZBA, we saw uh, the revised site plans and the stream was not included. And attorney Reedy said it was not part of the ORAD, but at looking at the ORAD, I see that it is part of the ORAD. So I'm a bit confused. Uh, look for clarification from Tom or from Corey. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, the intermittent stream on the adjacent property, which casts a buffer onto this property, um, which we're reviewing tonight, is does exist. It is covered under this ORAD. Um, I'm not sure that we need to discuss why it wasn't provided to the ZBA, but we are acknowledging right now that it was different. So I would just like to say that this ORAD and what we are approving tonight should be the material used to be presented to other committees, commissions in the town. So this is the, the facts that we're laying out right now. So going forward, we'd like to see this approved resource delineation provided to the ZBA and others like considering this plan. Um, Thank you, Jenny. Um, and I just have one more comment about this. I don't see any other commissioner hands up. Um, when we do have the NOI come up just to save a lot of back and forth, we do expect to see all the state and local resource areas delineated in it, um, you know, a DEP number. I, with the isolated land subject to flooding identified on the site, we are aware that they're there. We're not covering them tonight, but, um, just so you know, that the, what, that's what the commission's expecting when we when we see the next plan set. Um, let's see, is there anything else, commissioners, that you'd like to add? Okay, Jenny, I see that your hand is up. I'm not sure nope. if it's back up or nope. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, any other comments? And if not, I think we're looking to move to close this public hearing and issue this or add. All right, I move to close uh, the public hearing and issue an order of resource area delineation stamp plan set dated uh, 429-2024 under both Wetlands Protection Act and the and Wetlands Town of Amherst uh, general bylaws, article 3.31 and regulations, which drafted uh, with drafted form 4B and findings of fact, uh, referencing final draft date of 429-24 for Shootsbury Road maps 9B and 9D, lots 11, 12, and 27, DEP number 089-0727. I'll second that. We're on the motion, Jason on the second, Rachel. You're abstaining okay. on this? Yeah, okay. Um, Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. Alex? Aye. Um, Laura, can you vote on this one? Yeah, I can okay. do this one, just not Shootsbury, yep. Okay. Oh wait, this is Shootsbury. You mean oh no sorry i didn't one. mean to abstain from the last one then oh god i got confused <laughs> okay it's okay we just continued it All right so you're abstaining from this one that is correct okay got it all right um anam and i okay well thank you for attending to all those revisions and um we'll see you with the noi thank you, thank you, very you much. so much right. see you see everybody. Everybody. good night have a good evening Thank you. Okay, what do we still have? Um, UMass, just says UMass. <laughs> do you wanna take five on that one, Erin? Yeah, sure, am I muted? Okay, um, so um, I received a electrical permit application for some um, duck bank work at UMass. And in the course of that process, um, discovered that some, some work had been underway. And um, 
in my communications with UMass, um, they, uh, I'm not, there was a, a communication breakdown of some sort. And at this point, um, I, I advised them to submit to the Conservation Commission um, in compliance with their operation and maintenance order of conditions um, that they notify the commission of the work and ask the commission to approve it as operation and maintenance under their standing operation and maintenance order of conditions. Um, it, it should have come to the commission prior to the work beginning, but it didn't. So this is essentially a request for that, for the work to be um, approved on the duck bank retroactively. Um, there is a second part part of it, which is that there was some additional work done um, to install a um, an access road and a uh, um, crossing a culvert. And I've asked them to file a permit, um, an after the fact permit for that work. There's photos in the um, project folder. Um, so it's uh, that's basically what I'm um, suggesting to the commission at this point is that we um, retroactively approve the work that's underway under the operation and maintenance OMP and then work with them in the future um, on a after the fact filing for the work that's already underway. Thanks, Aaron. Bruce? How many times over the last five years would you say that we've had to give UMass a retroactive permission to do something? I mean, in my tenure, it's been maybe five, three. Not, not, a, not a significant number. I would call that fairly significant. I mean, okay. I was hoping someone would be here tonight so that we could discuss well, the prior approval component of the OMP. <laughs> That's what I was getting at. It, it feels egregious. Yeah, um, I, it does feel like a pattern, I'm gonna be honest. And it would be nice that if they, you know, they have their OMP, we understand what's in it, but there is the component of it, the work happens after it's reviewed and approved by the, the commission. So I don't know how to best get that message to them. Um, Aaron, maybe we could just talk about that offline. Go ahead, Alex. Um, I have company in the house this evening. So with your permission, I'm gonna leave early. You put in your time already, Alex. Have a good night. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, Andre. Yeah, uh, well, like um like Bruce, I'm a little bit tired of this. I've seen uh meaning it just seems to me that uh that that it keeps repeating itself. And I'm not ready to uh with what we have right now, I'm not ready to approve anything. I want to. I want to be able to talk to the folks who have been doing this, and and uh, <laughs> we got to find a way to uh, to make sure that they're checking with us uh, ahead of time. We keep finding out that they're doing work and uh, uh, after the fact, and I don't want to see that anymore. Any other commissioners? Jason. Yeah, I would. I. I echo that sentiment and I would I would also like to say it seems like they're continually utilizing SWCA, who I would also assume knows that they ought to be notifying us prior and getting approval before they start this work. And it since I've been on here, it seems like there's been two or three of them. So I would uh, I would just like to echo those comments. Thanks, Jason. Laura? Yeah, I, I think I'm not saying anything unique here, although um, just a broader perspective of it does seem a bit like a pattern um, and wondering whether it's Aaron or Dave and, you know, how we can, because uh, it, it feels a little bit disrespectful, honestly, of, um, of the work we're doing here. Um, so I don't know how to escalate it internally at UMass so it, the pattern can be broken. Thanks, Laura. Rachel? Yeah, I'm curious if it's the same group that's doing this, repeating the pattern, or if these different agencies within UMass, UMass is, you know, a big operation, um, and if 
if it's something that maybe you have to go higher up the chain uh, to, to get everybody on board um, to make sure that they're following the rules. Um, or if it's the same, if it's the same group doing it over and over again, that's that's definitely just. Thanks, Rachel. Um, all right, Dave, Aaron, you've heard some sentiments from the commission here, and it, it sounds like we might want to talk to them. I'm not sure uh, if people are willing to approve this without doing that first. But do you have a suggestion for communication line um, to? kind of straighten things out for process here. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I I, I, I understand the commission's frustration and there definitely has been a couple of these. I'm, I'm thinking of the, the culvert along the cinder path as probably the largest one um, in recent history. Um, I think, you know, it's perfectly within you, the commission's purview not to approve this retroactively and ask uh, somebody, the project manager, and perhaps someone, um, as Rachel suggested, um, higher up the org chart coming to your next meeting to explain why we are here again. Um, and Aaron and I could work on with them on who that might be. Um, but I, I do think it needs to be a conversation above the project manager on this particular project. So Aaron, um, we didn't talk about that before, but that certainly could, that conversation could take place before your next meeting in two weeks. Thanks Dave. Bruce? Well, an added component is looking forward to a year from this summer when they start taking all the water out of the pond. It's gonna be a huge chore and I think we need to have a really clear understanding with whoever the decision makers are about how they're going to do that way ahead of time and not have this kind of thing. Oh, well, we forgot to, to talk with you about this particular part of it. Um, it, it just so I, I agree with what Dave said as, as a first step, but I think it's going to take more than just one time. Yeah, good point. Um, mm -hmm. So perhaps um, moving forward with tonight is that we are not moving to approve this and we have their attention and we'd like them to come to the next meeting and discuss this uh, with us specifically before we make that approval. Does yeah, show of hands, is that palatable to everybody? Okay, yes, okay. Um, all right, so I don't think we're moving on anything and we're just tabling this to next time and we'll, and Aaron, please reach out okay thank you yep. okay um so i have um ever source on my agenda i don't and i see simon's here yeah i just want to make sure that we don't miss the issuance of the orad for amherst college which is on that oh, okay. same first slide um and then i think we've covered everything on the first other business slide long other business slide okay point drive perhaps we did that one uh, yeah, we took care of that point. Um, okay, where is this? Um, so I did draft the um, the ORAD. It's the just sort of the standard um, template, so to speak, um, with the additional conditions that we had discussed as far as the um, uh, areas that were not included in the delineation are highlighted in there, um, but just highlights the resources that weren't delineated. And um, yeah, so I have a motion teed up here, but there is a draft um, in the um, OneDrive as well. Okay, looking for a motion, unless there's any questions. Move to close the public hearing and issue an order of resource area delineation stamp plan set dated uh, 4-17-2024 um, under both the uh, Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands uh, Protection Town of Amherst bylaws, general bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations uh, with findings of fact for 151 and 0 College Street maps 
14B and 14D, lots 165 and 1, DEP number 089-0734. I will second that. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Rachel? I'm staying. Uh, Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. No, no. Okay. Is that a fire truck in the background somewhere? <laughs> I, I, think I keep hearing it too. It does. Is, uh... Bruce's computer or something. Oh, Every time okay. I hear it, his uh, he's his he's he's, he's claiming. <laughs> okay, almost there, guys. All right, um, Eversaurus. Yes. Okay. Maybe just it looks like, in your opinion, this looks good, and we can move to issues or take pit of compliance. Is that sufficiently stated? Yes. So, um, we did received the request for certificate of compliance from Eversource. Um, we also received some abutter um, comments. Um, I did reach out to uh, both the town attorney and DEP about sort of the outstanding um, concerns that were raised from the abutter comments. Um, and basically, I think that from where I sit, there's no wetland violations. The work appears to have been done in compliance with the order of conditions. Um, and it would be difficult for us to add a new condition to the order of conditions through the certificate of compliance process. Um, I do um, urge um, Eversource to work with the abutter to um, come to a solution um, on the outstanding abutter concerns. I'm just not sure that doing it through the Conservation Commission is the appropriate path. And that um, I would basically suggest that if there are additional um, adjustments that need to be made on the site, that a future permit be filed to address those outstanding concerns. Um, so that's that's kind of based on all of the advice that I've been able to gather. That's my recommendation to the commission. But I know that um, uh, the applicant is here as well. So if um, if you want to hear from them on the responses to the abutters' concerns, that's totally fair. Okay. Um, so I realize there's some sensitivity around this and, um, Aaron did do a lot of due diligence to see where the commission, uh, has purview over it and what's appropriate per the conditions. So, um, if there's any comments from Eversource, just please raise your hand. Um, otherwise, commissioners, any comments? Okay. Um, okay, so I guess given uh, what we understand about this and what our um, legal purview is, I think we're looking to move to issue the Certificate of Compliance for DEP number 0890675. Um, I'll go ahead and make the motion to issue a certificate, um, complete Certificate of Compliance for 14 Indian Pipe Lane, MAP 21D, Lot 49, DEP number 0890775. Director Reed below for it for the forest cutting plan review. Sorry, oh, I yeah. think yeah, but that was the, yeah. Move okay. up. <laughs> uh, motion to issue a complete certificate of compliance for DEP number 089-0675. Am I holding there? Am I reading more? I'll second that one. Okay. Okay. Uh Laura on the motion, Andre on the second. Um, Rachel. Abstain. Laura? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm aye. Okay. Um, Pine Street. Certificate of compliance required as built plan. Building inspector did not require as built. Yes. So this is really at your discretion. The the order of conditions required an as-built plan um, to be provided, but the building inspector did not require it because the 
typically, um, according to the building inspector, they are only requiring those if they're um, close to the lot setback or there are other sort of um, issues where they need to make sure that um, there are sort of compliance issues with zoning or other um, sort of limitate lot limitations, so to speak. Um, so in this case, because they were well within the lot line, the building department didn't require the as built. So the applicant didn't prepare one and they're hoping because it's a simple home addition that the commission might consider that. Um, I did go out and do a site visit and I can show you the um, site visit photos. They did um, complete the planting of the um, blueberry bushes. The barn um, was removed. Um, which was right on the slope, um, and that area was um, mulched. Um, my one observation on the site was there were, um, they do have a, a thicket of Japanese knotweed that's just poking up, um, and also um, I did observe that they have um, some winged euonymus and um, some um, uh, Barbary in the in the back of the lot, which um, you know are pretty, I would say pretty significant. Um, and I had suggested that they might want to consider some invasive treatment um, on the site to address them. Um, you can see the knotweed sort of popping up here in the freshly seeded and mulched lawn area. Um, these are the blueberry bush plantings. This is in the barn footprint uh, where the barn has been removed. Erin, um, was there anything in our order of conditions that required them to do any kind of invasive treatment or is this more of a no, no, as a, uh, yeah, it was it was not called out specifically um, in the in the order of conditions to do invasive treatment. Okay. And they said that they may. Um, try to address it in the future, but they um, didn't want to deal with it as part of this order of conditions since it wasn't incorporated into it initially. Okay, well, that that's that, I guess. Um, hey, Jason? I noticed that their straw waddle was still in place. Um, it doesn't appear to be Biodegradable it looks like it's wrapped in a plastic mesh. Um, are we requiring removal of those things as part of our um, certificate of compliance? Yeah, I mean, I was there. The grass is just starting to poke up, so I didn't want to take the wattles out just yet. Um, so it's you know they're they're looking to get a certificate of occupancy and they're done with all work. So it's really you know, completely at your discretion if you want to hold off to issue until that comes out, um, if you want to wait and get an as-built, um, if you're comfortable issuing now and I could do a follow-up inspection in two or three weeks once the grass has come in and ask them to remove that, um, the casing on the waddle. Um, good catch, Jason. I would definitely like to see that waddle and the plastic removed. Um, I guess when that happens versus when we issue this is is more of the tricky part. Can I just ask why our order of conditions had the as built? That doesn't seem to be something we typically include in our order of conditions. Yeah, I mean, um, so to be totally a honest, it's kind of um, Amherst is unique. Like a lot of towns I've worked for require as built in their building department for everything that's constructed. Um, Amherst doesn't so much. So I've kind of been adjusting um, our orders of conditions to correspond with, um, you know, because it doesn't seem fair to ask an applicant, like ordinarily, like in, uh, in some towns I've worked for, the, the building department would require the as-built and so they would already have it and be sharing it with, it'd be readily available for other departments to utilize for their um, permit process, but since they're not being required to do that, I, um, you know, at the close out of a permit, it's, it's, it's a, feels a little unfair to ask it of them. Um, I think there are instances where it's very appropriate. For example, um, 
in cases where somebody's building really close to a wetland and you're trying to ensure that they're not putting a structure closer than where the structure was actually permitted to go. Um, so for example, if the commission allowed a structure to be say, over 25 feet away from a wetland, you may want an as-built to be completed to ensure that the project wasn't going any closer than 25 feet. Um, so those are sort of more um, project specific that may trigger something like that. Okay, thanks for the background. Dave? Yeah, I was just gonna suggest that it strikes me on this situation that what the commission is looking for with regard to Jason's concern about the the, the straw wattle is, is a fairly minor thing. And so, you know, I would recommend you, you, you take action on this tonight. Don't carry it to the next meeting. Um, you know, Aaron has the discretion and your, your, um, your uh, authority, if you will, to go out and make sure that is removed at the appropriate time when the grass has grown. I'm just trying to, you know, encourage you to move, move yeah. these, these simple things along and not, you know, come back up your agenda. Yeah, I I totally agree. I guess I we can't really condition a certificate of compliance, can we? I mean, so it's just sort of you're gonna check in with them in a few oh, weeks. No, you can you can okay. condition it. You could you could issue you could issue the certificate of compliance contingent on um a follow up inspection in two weeks and removal of the straw wattle. All right. Well, that's good with me. All right, so then can I move to issue a conditional certificate of compliance uh, with ongoing condition 789 DEP number 089-0697 conditioned on the removal of the straw wattle once the grass has uh, emerged, fully emerged? Yes, second. Based on the motion, Rachel, and the second. Rachel? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. No, I'm nigh. Okay. Uh, Indian Pipe. Should I get a compliance? Yeah. So. so this is a holdover from a 1981 orders of conditions for the... Um, uh, sorry. Amherst Woods. Um, uh, project. And this this site's actually not even located in buffer zone. It was just part of the overall subdivision. But I did go out and verify that the site is stable. Um, there were no issues there. So I recommend a complete certificate be issued on this one. I will move to issue a complete certificate of compliance for 14 Indian Pipe Lane, MAP 21D, Lot 49, DEP number 089-077. Just a second. Jason on the motion. Rachel on the second. Rachel? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an I. Laura? Aye. Sorry. <laughs> and I'm an I. Um, okay. Uh, forest cutting plan review. That was in your folder. There's nothing really to discuss. Um, but per my general comments on the forest cutting plans, uh, we don't have a lot of control over these, and I just want to keep pointing out that um, at some point we may want to consider a bylaw, um, even when we do ask for some kind of assurances or oversight or site visit, it generally isn't um, permitted, or I don't know if permitted is the word, but um, determined not to be necessary. So um, sometimes it's probably just fine. I just kind of want to point out that um, this is how forest putting cutting plans go to the extent I'm not even sure why they come to us. So that's my two cents on forest cutting plans. Bruce, go ahead. Aaron, there was a lot of back and forth and you drew several times on the map that there were wetlands there and then the state said, no, there's not wetlands there. Is that basically where we ended up? Yes. Okay, well, it just. Yeah, um, anyway, so. You, not them. That's what... What's that, Bruce? I trust you, not them. 
Yeah, um, it's probably a little late to get into this. So um, just just noting that here's one, take a look at it. Um, there'll be more. Uh, monitoring reports, are there any things to know? A big, yes. big monitoring report. I mean, we're, we are in full swing. Um, there are a ton of projects under construction in town and um, doing my best to keep them all sort of under watchful eye. Um, but yeah, you'll see there's a lot of monitoring reports in your folder this week. Okay, public comment. We have one holdout. Okay, not seeing any hands. I think that's it, we got everything? I think so. Okay, great, thanks for hanging in there, everybody. It's a big one. Okay, with that, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I am an I. All right, guys. Nice work. Good night. Can I ask a question of Aaron? Have you ever seen anybody vote no on the adjournment? <laughs> no. No. Nope. I couldn't <laughs> even consider such first, a thing. <laughs> I vote in favor, too. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody.